Yeah. Some, uh, some, some song uh, some, no, 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 no. written since the new guy uh, took charge. <laughs> Someday, I'll tell you without lying, I was born to quit smoking, I was born to quit dying on that day, not doing heroin will seem easy as pissing, on that day, I'll stop talking so much shit about the government, cause urine speaks louder than words, on a politician, or on a prison warden, urine speaks louder than words. When they want to forget something like centuries of racism They'll say look at the man on center stage and pay no attention Well millions get locked in a cage and riots break out in Oakland But urine speaks louder than words on a prison warden Or on a BART policeman, urine speaks louder than words People are ready to do that, but should yeah, yeah, yeah. do it. It's, it's kind of hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'm gonna save that one until the end. I'll play a couple. I'll play a couple more songs, and we'll, we'll try that one out. Uh, all right, I'll just play. I'll play a song about being very shy, which I am a large portion. Of. <laughs> really? <laughs> Tonight I'm an alley cat. Yeah, more afraid of you than you are of me. But if you leave some food out on the porch, I might stay till there's nothing left to eat. I'd be sitting a lot alone at a lunch table in high school. If I wasn't sitting alone at a punk show in Asheville. Hey, hey, hey. Tonight the upper left hand 
inside of my chest Has a hole as big as the one in my pockets I might have kissed you wearing a bulletproof vest But hell, you kiss, kiss like a rocket I'd be a teenage virgin Jerking off in my bedroom If I wasn't a 20 year old virgin that doesn't have a bedroom hey, hey, hey. Nobody's business jam, then I think we should do it. Yeah! yeah. The, the structure of the song will become clear very quickly. Yes. And then, you know, anyone, anyone who wants to just take their turn and sing their verse. Alright, this is based on a song by my man Mississippi John Hurt, who was like punk as fuck before punk rock existed. By decades. By decades. Punk rock. I don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. Uh, we're, all, we're all part of it somehow, but I don't think any of us know the <laughs>
maybe then I won't always feel lost or trapped. <laughs>
What's up, everyone? This is gonna be a this is gonna be a bit of an interesting stream. We got a couple of things on the docket for today. Um, we are gonna be doing Popo's Bizarre Adventures. We've got <clears throat> a bit of a list. Uh, we've got a few things to cover. Um, I'm not gonna get right into it, but I know I did tease it, and I know a few of you are quite looking forward to reviewing um, <clears throat> some evidence. Um, we will go through that um, piece by piece. We will, um, we will do that. So if you are unaware of what uh, I'm alluding to, then you probably have some homework to do, frankly. But um, uh, how is everybody's day? How is everybody's midday? Fuck it, midweek. Right, Wednesday, hump day. How are y'all doing? Um, so, hang on, let me kill a couple of tabs here too. While I'm at it. Oh, oh, a little itchy, a little itchy. <clears throat> I got a, I got a core workout in. Uh, I still need to do some legs after stream. Um, I think I'm gonna lay off the, uh, the arms today, the weights. Uh, forearms are a little touchy, but you know. Um, yes, it will, um, we will be covering that cupcake. Most assuredly, we will be covering that in to, to a great detail. I've got a, a little spread laid out, shall we say. We're going to, we're going to go through all of that, but <clears throat> until then, until then, um, well, I'm sorry. You're stuck on 1080p, uh, wither. Good luck with that. Ah, uh, so let's just right out of the way. Let's get a couple of things out of the way, just so everybody knows. Oh, um, <laughs> Craig's, um, oh, good, good on you, Wither. It's my Friday, and that last song brought me to tears. Oh, uh, Pat, Pat does that. Dude, just watching Pat perform from the old days kind of gets me a little, a little misty-eyed, a little misty-eyed. So I, I'm, I'm right there with you, Tech. Um. Yeah, um, I think there's a couple of things that people should be aware of. One of them affects us on a, a countrywide level if you're in the U.S. Um, while everybody was being uh, paying attention to the, the, you know, rich man who slapped the other rich man at the billionaire's ball, um, Congress announced that they would not be renewing the universal, um, like, a universal lunch program for schools. So the federal funding for the uh, universal lunch program that we implemented during COVID to make sure that all the children were fed. And we noticed that it cost us basically nothing and that we could have been doing it the entire time. And that it, uh, it, uh, it brought 10 million children out of hunger, out of like, you know, out of food scarcity on a daily basis. Uh, yeah, we won't be renewing that. They're getting rid of that program. So... You know, when when everybody was when everybody w thought, you know, when everybody was busy being distracted by black man slap black man, um, what was actually happening in our society was we were deciding not to feed children. So I would encourage you the um, <clears throat> the next time that there is that sort of memeable Hollywood moment, pay attention to what's going on in the background. Because generally speaking, there's something happening, and it's usually sketchy. Um, powers that be use oppor they don't allow opportunities to go to waste like that. So yes, that's that's what our Congress was doing while man slap man um, was decide to not feed children. So you know that's that's just something. Um, also, if you weren't aware, the don't say gay bill, um, fuck you Twitch mods, fuck you Twitch, fuck, fuck, fuck all that. Um, the don't say gay bill did get passed. Ron DeSantis passed that into law. So, you know, look forward to all of the knock on effects that that will be having. <clears throat> and I'm not even going to bother talking about any of the bullshit Trump stuff. All right. Like we all know, we all know. Um, we all know what's up there. That's, that just is what it is, right? Um, Alex Jones 
being a rich white man, managed to scrape by the the skin of his teeth again. Um, the judge didn't throw his ass in jail. Um, fuck her for that, by the way. She should have tossed his ass in jail for contempt of, contempt of court. Um, but like, I mean, that's what happened. It would happen to any of the rest of us, right? I'm not arguing for jail. I'm not arguing for anything. I'm saying that if we live in this system, it should be applied equitably and equally, but we know it isn't. So he gets to pay a $25,000 escalating um, fine. So 25,000 today, 25, uh, 50,000 tomorrow, 75,000 the next day. Um, that is the fine structure that has been given to him. He's fundraising off of this, by the way. Um, <clears throat> in today's episode of Rich White Man Gets Away With No Consequences, Alex Jones will not be going to jail. Um, yes, um, he's fundraising off this, by the way. I'm not kidding you. He's making money right now. The $25,000 a day fine doesn't even, like, he's actually profiting. He's profiting. Um, so, you know, there's that. <laughs> um yes yes tech support i mean that's that's just that's just part and parcel with you know manipulation and management right right that's that's just part of manufacturing consent so it is what it is um i'm gonna hang on to what the 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 lead um I cannot. That is on Twitch's side. That is Twitch's. That is Twitch's side. They have decided that um, uh, apparently there is enough of a load right now on the servers that the video codec processing should not be deemed. Uh, our channel shall not be deemed worthy for it. That's just how Twitch works. So, yes. Um, Amazon apparently doesn't have enough server processing power. That's 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 the only thing I can I can infer is that Amazon's web services platform is in fact weak. Um, it is underpowered because they are unable to provide uh, video uh, video downscaling to the entirety of their platform. Um, so, yes, you you can turn on audio only. Um, yeah, you can turn on audio only right now, bananas. So if you just wanted to listen, turn on audio only. That'll kick it down for you. Um, so yes, that is, that is how it is at this moment. Um, <clears throat> No, it won't. Cupcake, no, it won't. Um, let's see. Was there anything else I wanted to talk about at the top? Um, oh, yes, Washington Post. Um, the Washington Post has been showing its um, true colors. Um, the Washington Post published an opinion piece. Um, so, you know, it says, Washington Post, democracy dies in darkness. Um, did I not? Oh, I didn't even push the button here. There you go. Um, yeah, I didn't even push the button. Kubis. This is what it is. Um, so the Washington Post democracy dies in darkness, right? Here's the headline. The CIA funded a culture war about uh, against communism. It should do so again. I so love billionaire controlled media and conglomerates. That's that's one of my favorite things. Yes. So, it's an opinion piece. It's not an official article. They get to hide behind that that clause. Um so yeah, they get they get to shield themselves via that clause work that it's oh it's only an opinion piece it's not an official uh, Washington Post it's not an official uh, there we go hang on I 
Yeah, I don't see it on browser either, to be frank. Um, also, when did they fucking stop? Che, that's a valid point. Um, y'all are having a lot of internet issues today. I will state that. Y'all are not doing well with internet. Just, just good news, like good news for all of you, I guess. Um, it's an interesting uh, survey that came out recently. Half of all Americans now think tackle football is inappropriate for children to play. Now, here's the catch. When you start controlling for variables, um, that doesn't stand up. The half that believes tackle football is not appropriate for children to play is not the conservatives and Christians. Republicans slash conservatives slash Christians, i.e. those with a more traditionalist values, were highly likely to say foot tackle football was appropriate for youth. So the only ones who actually believe that tackle football is inappropriate for youth are the ones who believe in things like science and don't believe in magic man in sky tell me what to do. So if you're wondering how that culture war and that cultural divide in our country is coming along, there you go. That's how it's coming along. Um, yeah, dig. They're always there. They're, I've had very few issues in my area. <laughs> What's a little brain damage between kids? Glazy, I don't want to cancel sports. I just don't want kids to grow up with CTE and like chronic brain injuries by the time they're 14. Right? Like can, that's, that's not good. That's child abuse. I thought we were, we liked kids. I thought we were for kids. I thought we were on the side of protecting kids. Right? Putting them knowingly into an activity that has a direct causal link to lifelong brain damage seems like not good for kids. Right? Should we feed them paint chips too? Because while we're at it, what's a little lead paint for, uh, between, uh, between friends, right? Ah, you fucking, you, you fucking kids today are soft. Back in my day, we used to lick lead paint and radium water. We used to drink radium water. You fucking soft kids today. What's a, what's the problem with a little radium in your water? Come on, man. Come on. It, we know what it does. Ah, yes. Yeah. And the uranium glasses, um, you know. It, it, come on. We're not looking to cancel sports. We're looking to not engage knowingly in an activity a, a activity that has a direct causal link to lifelong traumatic injury to the brain. That's all. Like it, it's it's kind of it's abusive. It, it really is. They're not old enough to know better. Dude, peewee football and fucking like high school football and even junior high. Junior high football is tackle. Right? Junior high. You're going to fucking, you're going to tell me that you're okay with a sixth or seventh grader. Hold on. Let's talk about the trans issue, right? Is the sixth grader mentally cap capable of making lifelong decisions that may permanently impact them? If we're talking trans issues... The answer is no. But if we're talking football, the answer is yes. Hmm. Me thinks me smells a bit of hypocrisy. They either are or aren't. Last time I checked, supposedly they aren't. So let's, you know, not thrust children into sports that we know cause these problems. That's about all I'm saying. After they're 18, fine. They can make their own decisions. They're legally adults in our system, even though I maintain they're not. Um, <clears throat> yeah, 
Yeah, who's gonna put who's gonna place small town Texas on the map if not Johnny Football? Um Body checking starts at like 14 or 15 here in hockey, says Rye. Yes, I'm being serious, Glazy. Children shouldn't be allowed to play tackle football, nor should they be allowed to play full contact hockey. I'm being serious. It's abusive. It's child abuse. It's it's gladiatorial sports for the entertainment of adults at the cost of children's futures. Yeah, I'm being serious. It shouldn't be allowed. That's insane. Why don't why don't we just give them a fucking sword and let them fight it out in the arena for us? That's batshit nuts. It's child abuse. Tackle football at middle school age is child abuse. <laughs> Bananas. If you don't brain damage kids, how the fuck are they going to grow up to vote Republican? Um, yeah. No, I'm 100% serious. None of this is meme. None of this is a fucking joke. Uh, Buddhist. In my school, we had tackle football in the fifth grade. Yeah. The caboose. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to name them, but there are prominent football players who will not let their kids play football. Right? Something like that, Che. Something like that. Uh, 14 is usually freshman in high school. So I would say like 9 to 11, something like that. Yeah. Um, Dig said, we have kid football leagues here in Vegas um, that are contact. The kid I nannied for was 9 and was in full contact football. That's child abuse. That's child abuse. That's what that is. Uh, in my district, middle school starts at fourth grade now. Um, interesting. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry. I'm just going to call you Ash. I'm sorry. Um, but Ash, what's um, what? Can you give me a location? I don't don't dox yourself or anything. But can you narrow it down? Where? What part of the country? What part of the world? Like, what is that? Where is that? Um, doing full contact at nine. What the fuck, man? Says Jay. Yeah, no. Um, beast, I'd rather see kids in MMA tournaments than football. Dude, the, the impact from football, from a, uh, a tackle in football, it's huge. Fourth to eighth grade is intermediate. Um, Beloy, Wisconsin. Okay, cool. Thanks, Ash. Uh, and there were younger kids, says Dig. Oh, Jesus. Is, um, um, Stone. Is motocross a, a school sport activity that's organized and paid for by taxpayer money? Or is that an independent private activity? Because the last time I checked, my school didn't have any motocross teams. Hey, punk. I, you know, maybe maybe you live, live in a particularly bougie, rich-ass neighborhood and your school has motocross teams. But last time I checked, there's not many motocross uh, teams in public school. Mm. Funny how a little context and knowledge goes a long ways. Um, <laughs> thanks, Ash. Um, yeah, thanks for that follow, Ash. Uh, I guess your school wasn't upper middle class white enough, Kai. I, I know, right? With her? Jesus Christ, I got screwed. Where was my motocross team? God damn. God damn, Obama. <laughs> Tech support. But if we don't let kids get CTEs, who's going to grow up to be cops? <laughs> or as some, as Beast pointed out earlier, or Buddhist pointed out, Republicans. Um, hey, Saf. Um... I have wor uh, worldly of the opinion that the junior motocross is safer than uh, kid kid hand egg. Um, I would argue that motocross probably is safer than than football. Yeah. Um. I we had a golf team, Aka. We had a golf team. Yeah. Um. Take it from a uh, take it from a middle schooler. Kids in middle school are not responsible enough to be able to fucking tackle each other. The school is against after school fights, but not against after school fights with rules that are run by adults. Yeah. No. Saf. For sure. Dude. The whole thing is child abuse. The whole thing is child abuse. There's no way around that. 
Uh, did we have a fencing team? You know what, Bobby? To be perfectly honest, I don't know. I We might have. But I got to tell you, fencers were fucking so far off my radar. Dude, the only reason I knew we had a golfing team was because I was friends with one of their golfers. That's it. That's the only reason I knew we had a golf team was because I was buddies with one of the golfers. I wouldn't have known otherwise. I wouldn't have known otherwise. So we could have had a fencing team. Fuck if I know. Dude, there was like 1,400 kids in my, cl in my freshman class alone. I don't fucking know. I'd have to you know what I could check my I could check a yearbook I could check a yearbook and find out if we had a fencing team or not and get back to you um, <laughs> uh, my school didn't even have a music class it says stone oof is that some inner city shit I mean yes whether fuck golf uh, I don't want to just strain yourself that's that's fine yeah I don't I don't need to go through that uh, oh, fuck. My trash-ass state school had a golf team and a fencing club. We were all bloody council state kids, man, says Jay. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, Dig, I know, right? Which one did you go to, Dig? Do you mind telling? Or DM me. Which one did you go to? Um, I'd be interested to know which one of these shit shows you went to. Um... You're astonished by this take that I, I, I don't want to, like, physically abuse children to the point of chronic mental illness, chronic, like, brain trauma for the rest of their life. You're shocked that I that I would say something like that, that we shouldn't be con pitting children against each other in gladiatorial style combat for the entertainment of adults and for the uh, for the purposes of revenue uh, driving uh, revenue gains for a school. You went to Cheyenne. Okay. All right. Interesting, Dig. Always always fascinating to see. Always fascinating to see around these parts. Am I going to throw a hissy fit when Trump wins in 2024? Um, I mean, good luck with that. But if he wins, I don't throw hissy fits. I do direct action. I'm an anarchist. We tend to make things happen. So, it won't be a hissy fit, no. <clears throat> oh, Saf, we welcome everyone. Um, Glazy, why do you think they want to play? Why do you think they want to play? Could it be that their dad watches football on the weekends? Could it be their entire town is invested in football? Could it be the fact that the the school itself promotes and encourages football? Could it be that they live in an entire culture and society that values and puts billions, tens of billions of dollars into this sport? Could it be that they are aware of these processes? Oh, no, I'm not the bro the window-breaking kind, Stone. Um, you've never encountered an anarchist like me. I assure you that you, you've probably never even encountered an anarchist to be quite frank, but you've never encountered one like me. I'm a whole different school. Um, yes. Black people might know about this football theme you speak of Kai. I know whether, could there be some level of, oh, I don't know, perpetration upon a, uh, subset, uh, say a, a marginalized community within our society that takes advantage of a particular athletic prowess and uses them like disposable objects and tosses them away when they have no more to give only to rot and fester and die in obscurity with so many, many chronic conditions of the brain. I may look like I weigh 90 pounds, but if you want to see what I actually look like with my shirt off, feel free to join the Discord and go to the Anarcho Meatheads channel, and you can see me shirtless. And then you can make your decision from there. Um, but no, I don't weigh 90 pounds. Uh, could we afford soap in my high school? No, but we can get a new stadium. Um, <laughs> damn abs, though. Hmm? 
Yeah. Um, but I love that you are judging me based on, oh, I don't know, shallow rem- remedial values. It shows how depth, how you how much depth of character you have that your go-to is hissy fit, break windows, and then an attack on my perceived physicality. Would you like to actually have an in-depth discussion about topics and philosophy and ideologies and values? Or would you like to, I don't know, throw shit from our mitts like, a, uh, like the primates behind the bars at the zoo? Because I will have the conversation. I will happily engage in the dialectical exercise. I'll bring you on air and we can have the conversation on air together. More than happy to. But you're going to have to step up your game because your valuation doesn't mean much to me. (laughs) Bobby, I remember when I was a scrawny white kid. You are anything but a scrawny white kid, Bobby. Oh, no, I don't have discussions with people in chat. You have to come on the air and have the discussion. If we're going to have a conversation, we're going to have a conversation. So get out of chat, get on the air, and step up. (laughs) Aka, there are more abs now. Congrats, guy. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. I put a lot of work into it. So either you don't hide behind the keyboard and you actually engage in the dialectical exercise, as it were, or that's it. I move on to the next topic and I move on from this. So your decision. Is hissy fit a common term in the U.S.? It seems more of a Brit phrase to me, a phrase to me though I may just be ignorant. Che, it is, uh, gen- hissy fit is generally used for infantile behavior in the U.S. It is what parents use to describe what a toddler or infant does to gain attention, albeit generally uh, fruitlessly. <laughs> Kai collecting abs like Pokemon cards. Um, so... I, I presume that you will not, you'll have a discussion with me in chat about how good bananas are. You know what? I'm not a big, a big fan of bananas, actually. Oh my God, I love bananas. I, I They have their place, don't get me wrong, but I'm really not the like, you know, eat a banana type guy. It, it's the texture. It's not the flavor. It's the texture. What's up, nonsense? It's the texture, not the flavor for me. Um, a, a firmer banana. I prefer a greener banana. Those I'll eat. But once a banana gets ripe, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah, has to be has to be gr- towards the greener side. Yeah. Anyway, so apparently stone whatever, stone deaf is not prepared to actually be anything other than a keyboard warrior. Not it doesn't have what it takes to step up to the mic as it were. So I will be moving on to the next topic. <clears throat> so what you're saying is you like erect banana, says non-binary. Yes. Um, yes. What's up? What's up, left? Hey, there's a, a, a song. Um, so let's move on to the next topic. Um, I want to do this. Um, okay. So for those of you who were here and are aware of the conversation I had on Monday. Monday. Um, we had an on-air conversation with an individual that goes by the name Dr. Professor SC. He maintained that he was a conservative, um, with a, a good on you, Af- Safik. Uh, he maintained that he was a conservative with eight years of education in, um, in psychology with a, f- with a study in early childhood development. Uh, It was part of his field of study, though not a specialization. Um, He came on air to discuss my position. As uh, my position as such, we were discussing the don't say gay bill um, that has been passed in Florida. And I am of the position that early life comprehensive sexual education is a net positive for society and the individual. 
he was of the position and thesis that it is a net negative. Um, during this conversation, I, um, I put forth the uh, ver various studies and facts and positions and Dr. Professor SC maintained that his expertise uh, allowed him a wide variety and varied uh, allotment of sources. Uh, though he could not produce any at the time, he uh, promised us at the end of the, uh, the piece that he would gather his bookmarks together. We agreed that conservative websites weren't a... Uh, a, a viable source and that he was to be restricted to peer-reviewed medical uh, journals, medical journals, university publications, the traditional uh, um, fields and areas of publishing of these sorts of academic texts that are standard within the, uh, within the, uh, the space, right? This was agreed upon. Um, he said that he could provide and compile a list of resources that could prove his point that the conservative position that early life comprehensive sexual education is a net negative to the individual and society both. Now, I want to say before I go on any further, this is the message that I sent to um, uh, uh, Dr. Professor SC. It was not sent moments ago. It was sent early in, uh, it was sent early yesterday morning, inviting him back, saying, hey, bud, just wanted to inform you that the review process for granting access to the IDA project, don't worry, we'll get to it, I'll explain all of that, has gone through and they provided me with full access to all projects, we'll be, uh, and I've pulled the studies that you linked to. We'll be covering this in depth on Wednesday's show, and we'd love to have... Uh, I, miss, I misspelled, I, I said two back, have you back to explain your position further utilizing the calibration settings for the Siemens T3 scanners that you screenshotted for us ever so generously. Hope to see you, th uh, hope to see you there. Okay. I invited him back. Um, so it is Wednesday. I have heard neither hide nor hair from him. There, there, there is no return message. Um, so I just wanted to provide that, that in fact, while I will be speaking one-sided on this topic and he is not here to defend himself, the opportunity to be here, um, has been presented to him and he, uh, seemingly turned it down. Um, so. Later that evening, he posted to our Discord server one piece of of evidence, shall we say. Remember, the thesis is, is early life comprehensive sexual education a net negative or a net positive for society and the individual, right? This is the thesis. Now, he maintained that he could provide a plethora of research. This is the only piece of evidence that he posted. Now, he posted this and maintained that this proved, and we have this, we have this discussion, it's archived on our server, he maintained that this proved that his point was valid and my point was moot. So, the evidence that he provided as such is this. This is a screenshot. Now, I have removed his email since he gave us his email address. This is a screenshot from the IDA project, the imaging data and uh, uh, the imaging data archive at USC. This is a uh, that is a um, that is basically a repository of medical scans and imaging data varied across over 82, uh, there are up to 82 projects at this point. Um, the project that he pointed to was the Human Connectome Project. Now, I don't have that up here, but let's just Human Connectome. Oh, God, my typing is off today. 
Human Connectome Project. And let's get you over here. The Human Connectome Project is uh, a publication, uh, is a methodology, uh, is a project that is attempting to map the human brain. It is uh, a way to literally fly through brain pathways, compare circuits, all that sort of thing. It uses highly specific functional magnetic resonance imaging to provide this mapping, and it it aids to provide a compilation of neural data in order to graphically navigate the human brain. These are the links that he provided. He maintained that these three links, again, provide, uh, provided the evidence. Now, this is an individual who maintains they are a conservative and they have eight years of professional level study and, uh, and activity within the uh, field of psychology with an understanding of early childhood psychological development. These are the three pieces of evidence that he has provided us to obtain. Now, he would not provide us with this data. He would merely provide us a screenshot from the IDA Project webpage in which he did this. Now, what I can tell you before I go any further, is medical interfaces, uh, as far as software and websites go, are incredibly complex and poorly designed. Um, I know this as a lifelong IT guy. So, what he did was he did not have an he had an inability to understand what he was looking at, and as such, he came into the Human Connectome Project. He clicked download and he went to study data. Now, due to his complete lack of understanding of what he was looking at, he believed what he was providing us was some obscure fMRI data in its entirety and that these files would be large and huge and we would never be able to parse them. Also, all of this information is gated behind the University of Southern California's IDA project, and you have to apply for uh, access to this. You have to provide your academic credentials, you have to provide what project you are working on, and you have to get access to, and it is not an automatic approval system, you have to undergo review. Now, what I did was contact the IDA project and explain to them that in fact I have zero academic credentials related to this field of study and that in fact what I am is a streamer and this is what has occurred. An individual that has access to your project data who maintains they have eight years of study in psychology has argued with me on air that comprehensive early life sexual education is a net negative to society and the individual. Now, upon application to this, uh, to this project, you are informed that review processes take between five and seven business days for them to contact you back. Now, I have the timestamps on this. It was three hours and 54 minutes, I believe, before the project manager emailed me and said, you have full access to all project data and also... Do you have any relevant information or credentials or name associated with that individual? So I provided the project manager of the, uh, the IDA project with Dr. Professor SC's email address, as was originally on this screenshot he provided us. So. What you should know is that academics are very petty when it comes to protecting their data. They work hard for this sort of stuff. Now, what is this? What has he provided us? What is this evidence that is so damning and so convincing that, again, early life comprehensive sexual education is a net negative to the society and the individual because this is the position he argued. So, this is structural, uh, such, uh, structural and diffusion processing methods, EP2D, diffusion grad-warped BVALs and BVEX, and e uh, EP2D, diffusion grad-warped, and eddy current corrected BVALs and BVEX. Now, we will get there. Don't worry about it. So, let's start with the PDF. This is the PDF. 
This is the HCP Structural and Diffusion Data Methods PDF provided to us by Dr. Professor SC, who again is a self-described conservative with supposedly eight years in psychological study and a master's degree in psychology, who maintains that early life sexual childhood development of a comprehensive, uh, early life sexual education of a comprehensive nature is damaging to the individual. And this is his evidence. The introduction to the document states fairly unequivocally what the Human Connectome Project is. The Human Connectome Project has released structural and diffusion scans from 35 healthy adult subjects. Imaging protocols and processing methods are described below. Um, okay. Hold on. Let me, uh, I did want to get one extra thing. Give me, bear with me, bear with me. Um, I want you guys to see one extra thing. Uh, while we do this, there we go. Uh, I just need to log into my account on HCP and I want to grab something really quickly so y'all can see what we're all about. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. I should have prepared this element sooner. I, I completely forgot that I should have this element of the discussion prepared. That is, that is most assuredly my bad, um, but I think it's important for you guys to see. All right, um, and then we'll do that. All right, cool. Um, I can close that now. Now, <clears throat> so this is the PDF. Imaging protocols, each data set in the file format, consists of an MPRA AGE scan, a high-resolution T2 space scan, and diffusion scans with four different B values. Here are the, uh, the structural scan variables. This is how they are working at, right? This is their field of view millimeter size. It's 256 by 256 millimeters at the T1W. The T2Ws are 224 by 224 millimeters, right? These are scan specifications. All right, here is the structural scan specifications. Here is the diffusion scan specifications. How many slices the Human Connectome Project uses? 96 slices at 1.5 millimeters thick and a 1.5 uh, millimeter isotropic voxel size. That is isotropic uh, is actually a sort of a dimensional perspective, right? All of these are settings, okay? This is the diffusion data was acquired in oblique axial slices. So this is further description of how the methodology of the slicing of the MRI slicing of the 35 subjects brains was achieved. All right. This is the data pre-processing. What software tools they used. The descriptions of the structural scans and gradient non-linearity uh, linearity correction. So these are the processing methodologies that they used to run through run these images through for the structural scans. These are the processing methodologies they used for the diffusion scans. Here are the various references for the uh, various grad students and doctors who worked on this project. This is piece of evidence number one here at the bottom. Structural and diffusion processing methods. Again, this is his evidence that Early life comprehensive sexual education is a net negative for society and the individual, and this individual maintains he is a conservative with a master's degree in psychology and a study in early life childhood development. His, his username on Twitch is Dr. Professor SC. Right? That's not doxing. He came on the air. He volunteered his information. Let's go to the next one. EP2D diffusion grad warped BVALs and BVEX. Well... Okay, so those are zip files. These two next two are zip files. They contain this. This is a file manifest. This is all this is. It, the directory includes three files for each search subject, BVALS, BVEX, and BV, uh, BVEX FSL. Here's the file manifest, and here's a general description. The MGH USC HCP team has acquired and shared diffusion imaging data from 35 healthy adults scanned on the customized Siemens 3T Connectome scanner. The BVEX and BVALS data in this directory correspond to the EP2D diffusion grade warp data. Now, 
I'm saying things that don't mean anything to you. What is a BVAC and a BVAL? Well, let's go over to an introduction to diffusion weighted imagery of MRI data because this is what you need to do. So, they are gradient amplitudes, BVALs, and directions, B vectors. Okay, these are values and vectors for amplitude and directionality. Right? This of the diffusion measurement and are named with extensions B vowels and B vex. These are calibration settings, specifically in this instance for a Siemens 3T connectome scanner, right? MRI scanner. So the B vowels and B vex that this is referencing over here is essentially nothing more than a calibration setting that a, f a fellow researcher could use to set your MRI scanner to the exact same measurements and methodologies of scanning that the, t the HCP team at USC has used. So you can then further submit more data into this project if you wish to participate. That's what these numbers are. So what do these files look like? Because he has stated that this is, again, hard evidence, conclusive evidence that early life sec comprehensive sexual education is a net negative for society and the individual. Okay, so piece number two, what is this data? This is this data. That's what these files look like. And here is the eddy values. These are calibration settings for a 3T connectome scanner. That's what this data is. These are calibration settings. Now, you may be wondering, but Kai, there has to be more to this, right? There has to be more to this project. This is weird that all this is, is that. You're right. You are right. Um, let me, there we go. So let me show you what this project is actually about. Because remember when I said earlier that I could tell he didn't understand how to navigate this website? because what he did was go to download study data. And he thought that meant the entirety of the Human Connectome Project study data. But that isn't how IDA works. IDA, the Imaging Data Archive at USC, actually works this way. This is the study data. And don't worry, this data has been anonymized. This is a slice. As you can see down here, these are the planes of the slice that have to do with those BVEX and BVALs, right? It is an axial slice, and here's what that slice looks like, all right? This is the actual project data. Now, even if I were to be very generous, and state that this individual merely just was pointing us in the right direction. This is not conclusive evidence that early life comprehensive sexual education is a net negative for society and the individual. This is anything but. This would require a radiological review and, and then an interpretive opinion stating that maybe there is a a retardation of development in the free prontal cortex of this individual who received early life, sex, uh, early life sexual education. But none of that data is contained within the IDA project or the HCP project archives. They do not, co uh, co uh, they do not uh, collate their data, nor do they even collect that data. In no way, shape, or form is any of that variable set that would be required to justify or render such an opinion part of the data set of this project group. Okay? Now...
with that said, let me further do my due diligence because I can produce results. Now, here is a study published in the Global Health, uh, Public Health and International Journal for Research and Policy and Practice that if you want these links, I can provide these links to you uh, in Discord or in chat. This study, which was, uh, which was authored by a series of experts in a variety of positions, right? Essentially what this uh, document is, is about how investing in, quote, very young adolescent sexual and reproductive health is a net positive for society. Here is, here is your abstract, quote, in lower and middle income countries where most unwanted pregnancies, unsafe abortions, maternal deaths, and sexually transmitted infections occur, investment in positive youth development to promote sexual and reproductive health, SRH, is increasing. Most interventions, though, focus on older adolescents overlooking very young adolescents. Since early adolescence marks a critical transition between childhood and older adolescents and adulthood, setting the stage for future SRH and gendered attitude and behaviors, targeted investment in very young people is in imperative to laying foundations for healthy future relationships and positive SRH. This article advocates for such investments and identifies roles and policymakers, donors, program designers, and researchers and evaluators who can play to address the disparity. This is just the starting position, by the way. Uh, let me get my orientation here. Okay, cool. Now, because during that uh, conversation, I went on to point out that we have a 30-year comprehensive meta-analysis and multifaceted series of studies that have occurred between uh, juxtaposing the Netherlands versus the U.S. Now, on average, Dutch and American teenagers have sex for the first time around the same age, between 17 and 18. You could go to the Gut uh, Guttmacher Institute for this document. And you can verify this data for yourself. But they have dramatically different results. See, teen pregnancy has been on the decline in the U.S. for the past three decades. But despite that, American teenagers still give birth at five times the rate of their Dutch peers. Here is the CDC data providing that. Again, I will provide all my links if you want them. Five times the rate of their Dutch peers who also have fewer abortions you can go to the Guttmacher Institute of, about abortion worldwide. I have the full publication on that one as well. In the United States, people under 25 make up half of all new STI cases each year. You can go to the CDC for that information. While young people in the Netherlands account for 10% of new cases in their country, you can go to the Dutch publications for that one. You can translate that at your own volition. The document will be available. Socially, Sex is different too. Sexually active people sleep around less in uh, in the Netherlands. Here is a, uh, here is a research uh, here is a research gate published uh, document by a PhD and a woman at uh, University of Maine who have studied these uh, these uh, these issues. The uh, sexually active people in uh, in in the Netherlands sleep around less. They communicate more often, and. They are more open about their partners with likes and dislikes and report higher rates of sexual satisfaction. You can go for this document there. The Netherlands ranks as one of the most gender equal countries in the world as a result of this early life sexual education, which, by the way, starts when they are in third grade. They are number three in the world on the United Nations Development Gen uh, Program Gender Inequality Index, while the U.S. doesn't crack the top 40. Here is that, uh, that data and document, if you so choose. Since 2012, when the Dutch education minister mandated that all students beginning in primary school receive some form of sexual, edu uh, sexual education, this is the mandate, Right, um, that includes both le uh, that includes lessons on health, tolerance, and assertiveness. The core objectives are to prevent sexual coercion, cross the boundaries, and homophobic and transphobic behavior, as well to promote general inclusion within their society. New research has confirmed that comprehensive sexual education in school, lessons on sexual diversity and inclusiveness, in addition to the biological lessons, are uh, like uh, uh, those that receive that education are less likely to engage in name calling, more willing to intervene when LGBTQ or female, pe female peers are bullied in school. 
So this is literally, uh, they will step up and do, do the right thing. So in Dutch schools that use the current most, uh, the country's most popular sex ed curriculum, it's got a weird name, but it's actually translated to butterflies in your stomach. Yearly lessons be- begin with four, five, and six-year-old students talking about the differences between their bodies, learning about reproduction, and discovering your own sexual likes, dislikes, and boundaries. Third graders learn about love, including how to be kind to your crush instead of pulling their ponytail in the schoolyard. Before middle school, children get lessons on sexual diversity, gender identity, deciding when to have sex, how to use barriers and contraceptives. All along, all along this process, students are schooled in healthy relationships and how to reject gender role stereotypes. Since gender gender stereotypical thinking is a risk factor in poor sexual health outcomes. Here's this study on that one. As of... 2016, the CDC has set, stated unequivocally, comprehensive sexual education programs have been shown to reduce high-risk sexual behavior, a clear factor for sexual violence, victimization, and perpetration. Here's the document on that one. Published by, oh, let's see, three, five, five PhDs and two masters. Right? Now, in addition to all of this... There is plenty of evidence showing that abstinence uh, education programs are highly ineffective at preventing sexual activity and leave young people uninformed and unprepared when they do actually have sex. Here is a study from the Journal of Adolescent Health on that topic. Right? Um, And... When you study these outcomes, what you find is that you end up with higher rates of a pregnancy, higher rates of birth, higher rates of abortion if you do participate in these abstinence-only programs. Now, if anybody would like to step up and have this discussion with me from the other side of the aisle... Now is your opportunity. If you are a social conservative, if you think that it is grooming children, if you think that it leads to kids fucking and adults taking advantage of them, then now is when I open the floor to you. Having seen what I am capable of doing, what I am willing to, to do the extents to which I will go to check your sources and provide my own. Now is when I would invite you to speak up. I'll wait. Uh, so anyway. <clears throat> Me too. It went great. It went great as far as I'm concerned. Um, so there we go. Oh, well for them. Yeah, no, I, you know. Um, so I'm guessing um, <clears throat> the few conservatives, the few social conservatives we have in chat, the ones that were... Um, Speaking up. Mm. And you underestimated me because of my appearance. You know that, right? You judged a book by its cover. Do you ever think that maybe, I don't know, maybe I've crafted an appearance? My name is Kai. And do you know what radical means, by the way? If you were judging me based off of my name, my channel name, do you know what radical means? It means fundamental or systemic change, especially that within a a political system. See, knowing things is a powerful tool. I like knowing things. 
it allows me to do things like show people they are fundamentally ignorant and wrong that they have not analyzed their decisions that they have uh, they have arrived at conclusions without any level of due diligence that is what due diligence looks like it looks like contacting the University of Southern California to gain access to academic libraries and data sets to verify whether it is or isn't. And I'm more than willing to do that just to prove that the people banging on about how it's child abuse or how it's grooming or how it's inappropriate and should be left to parents are in fact committing child abuse and crimes against society itself themselves. If you advocate for te uh, for parent only sexual education, if you advocate for abstinence only programs, you are a criminal in my eyes. You are abusing children. You are condemning generations to negative outcomes, STIs, abortions, unwanted pregnancies, rape and sexual assaults, because we already know that abstinence-only programs increase rates of sexual assault. We already know that early life comprehensive sexual education reduces collegiate level rape and sexual assault. I've got multitudes of studies on those. So if you advocate for these positions, in my eyes, you are a child abuser and a criminal. And I'm willing to unequivocally state that. And I'm willing to back my shit up with research by dozens of PhDs and dozens of academic institutes across various oceans, not located in one section. In that list, we had Harvard and Columbia. And I mean, it was, it was a plethora, right? Some very, very lofty names and academics and PhDs and some studies that involve decades worth of work. Yeah. Yeah, I give a shit. And I'm willing to put some work in to show it. So. Uh, that's me putting it on the table. That's what that is. The entire segment was me putting it on the table. Because one dumb conservative irritated me. That's it. One conservative irritated me. So I spent a couple of days contacting research institutions, academic projects, getting clearance to access medical data, just to prove a point. Is it petty? Yeah, a little bit. Is it ethically and morally intact? You better fucking believe it. I'm the one who's not condemning children to rape. Well. Uh, yes, we will be doing Popo's Bizarre Adventures as well. Uh, yeah, we will be doing Popo's. But... I wanted to absolutely demolish a social conservative. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Spite is an amazing motivator. And yes, uh, that's I wanted to do a Ben Shapiro owns the libs segment. I've never done one. I've never done one before properly. I've always wanted to do one. That was Kai demolishing social conservatism. So, I hope you guys enjoyed. And a pile driver for good measure. Yeah. I don't want him getting up. If you see the name Dr. Professor SC say anything on this platform, no, he is 100% full of shit. He has no position, no standing, no leg to stand on whatsoever. Everything he says is full of shit. I want that dude's reputation set. Also, I want social conservatism's reputation set. They are child abusers. That's what social conservatism is founded upon. It is founded upon the coercive 
manipulations of early childhood development. All of it. Oh, it'll be up on the YouTube. It's a fucking, all of our conversations. It's, yeah, no, there's literally, the conversation with him ends with to be continued. That segment will go up as part two. Oh, yeah. I want it known the extent to which I will go. And I don't think, I don't think Twitch has seen the extent to which I will go sometimes. Some of you on Discord have seen it. Cupcake knows. Some of you that have been involved in those VCs when Cupcake and I do what Cupcake and I do understand. Don't fuck around. I'll check you. I'll fucking check you. I'll check your facts. You say some shit, you better back it the fuck up. You better back it the fuck up. Because you better goddamn believe I will go to the ends of the earth to fact check your ass to the wall. Caboose, the lengths you two have gone to have been astounding. Yeah. I don't fuck around. This shit actually matters. You know people live and die over this stuff, right? This stuff really is life or death. This shit really is. It's the difference between some fucking, you know, some college student getting raped by some douchey frat boy or not. Right? It's the difference between some fucking girl getting raped by her fucking creepy hillbilly uncle and then being forced to have the uh, have the child, right? It's the difference between some poor girl getting some some lower income um, girl getting pregnant and then being forced to carry the child, thus r- continuing the cycle of impoverishment. While the rich douchebag gets to pay for an abortion out of state and just ships the girl off to fucking college after that, right? It's the difference between epidemics of STIs and not. This shit matters. That one gay kid who had his door kicked down by another kid in the KKK carrying a baseball bat. Bubba and Justin. Yep. It's the difference between Justin getting his front fucking door kicked down by Bubba wearing a goddamn clan uniform, threatening his life with a baseball bat with his two douchebag buddies next to him. This shit matters. It is life or death. And when somebody fucking steps to me and says we're grooming children, congratulations, you're a child abuser and I, 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 can, I consider you a criminal. Straight up. Because clearly you're ignorant, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about, and the outcome of what you're fucking spouting out of your stupid goddamn mouth ends up in rape, murder, illness, lifelong poverty, and unnecessary abortions. Go fuck yourself. Social conservatism is a plague. Anybody advocating for it, step two and see what happens. I will show you what I'm capable of. (laughs) Because I think I've just demonstrated. Um, They gave me full access, y'all. They gave me full access. Project manager fucking emails me from Ida. You've been granted full access to the entirety of our projects. 82 fucking projects. They just granted me access. They're like, destroy them. (laughs) It's straight up. That's what that was. That was straight up the project manager for Ida saying, do our dirty work. Take him out. Yeah, I have zero academic credentials for this. Can I see it anyway? There's a dude misrepresenting your data. Sure, here you go. Have fun. <laughs> Caboose said here, debunk the shit out of this moron. Uh Kaiser, that guy that guy has a degree in false claim on top of his class with Takashi 69. Yeah, but you gotta back that statement up. Doginator. Okay, so why do you believe that? What what ethical framework do you have that renders that op- uh, that opinion valid? What what evidentiary proceedings do you have? What empirical evidence do you have? What what do you have 
I've just gone through a fucking hour long dissertation, essentially, on destroying a social conservative's thesis and the evidence they provided, and then providing pages and pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of my own evidence. So, if you're going to make a declarative statement like that, what do you have to back that statement up? Because this isn't a channel where you get to just make declarative statements without backing them up. Um, and if anybody wants, I will put, uh, you know what? I'm just going to post this. I'm going to post this. The, uh, I will post this text file, uh, to what I, I did today. If you want it temporarily, it's going, oh God. Yeah. You know what? It's going to go in citable sources. Yeah, it's going in citable sources. Uh, my sources list for what I just did today, it will be a text file. There's um, some uh, commentary. There's some, uh, there, there is some, um, there, where's my OBS? There it is. Um, Sapphic, are you not 18? You're not supposed to be here if you're not 18, Sapphic. This entire channel is 18 plus. Sorry, Sapphic. Yeah, like we, we talk about adult topics. It's just the way it goes. Um, yeah, come back when you turn 18. For real. Through your studies on this topic, do you come across any counter studies? No. That's the fucking point, Stone. I made this point when I was talking to this guy. This is essentially the the 1%, right? No one's on the other side of this. No one with any serious credentials. Um, no one with any serious credentials. There there are no fucking doctorates in early childhood development that are coming down on the other side of this. The evidence just isn't there. It's 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 all religious backed studies, right? It's all studies that are funded by Focus on the Family or the or the Catholic Church, right? That that carries an inherent biases. Yeah, Sapphic, I you know, that's rough, but we got to do what we got to do. Is cyber? Yeah, there's an occasional grifter, right? But nothing nothing that holds any academic credibility whatsoever. No, they're not. Of course they're not. They're backed by by an institution that believes in an invisible man in the sky and relies on faith, not evidentiary hearings or empirical evidence uh, or empirical evidence, right? Of course they're not reliable. Um yeah. Especially when they have an inherent uh, agenda, right? Focus on the family has an agenda. Like they straight up advocate for. So, yeah, no, of course they're not religious studies aren't reliable. Not at all. Because social democrats praise free, sh free shit all the time and can never explain to how, p how to pay for all this shit. Um, that is one of the most reductive, rudimentary uh, characterizations of a Demsoc position I have seen in a while. Um, Again, judging judging things by its cover. Stone, I hope I all I can say is I hope today you um, maybe learned a lesson or two. Um Beast. Oh beast. Um Yeah, Doginator. If you want to come on the air and discuss the merits or the drawbacks of some of the positions of democratic socialism, I'm not a dem sock, um, but I can I can at least hold my own from their corner a little bit. What what, what is your actual position, um, Doginator? Yeah, Doginator, Doginator. What is your actual position? 
you seem you seem antithetical to or at least it seem opposed to democratic socialism but you don't have an actual opinion what is your position um gl when your worldview is based on a foundation of faith as you, faith as your source of evidence you're well primed to believe anything and everything and fall prey to fake news and wildly false conspiracy theories yes uh that is pretty much the summation of that uh, study that we covered recently um that the uh, that uh, the the study author found that fundamentally it shows a lack of early life education and a cascade of ignorance that compiles uh, throughout life. Yeah, tech support. Why not? Let's fucking get him on air. Wait, he's a fascist? All right, come on air. I want to have the conversation. That'd be great. Let's do this. You want you want to come on air and actually talk? I mean, you've seen so far. I'll have the conversation. I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit. You're a fascist. I mean, I'm gonna fucking have critiques of your position for sure. Um, but I'll talk to you. I'll I'll actually engage in the conversation where a lot of fucking streamers would not. A lot of streamers would not have that conversation. Oh yeah, I'll fucking talk to him. You believe in white power. Congratulations. Um, then get your white power ass on my air and defend your position like a man. Sure, I'll give you 15 minutes. Everybody start the clock. Everybody start the clock. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. An anarchist? Arguing with a fascist? Dude, this is historically appropriate. This is this is as contextual as it gets. This is this is this is this is tradition. Right? I'm I am honoring the tradition of my forefathers and foremothers. Yeah. Oh, it's not a heavyweight zero. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I, I, dude, he hasn't read shit, right? He, I get, dude, fascists are usually highly ignorant of their own fascism. Dude, it'd be hilarious, Kaiser, if he rolls out some fucking evil or some shit. Um. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the efficacy of fascism. And also, by the way, you better have your international encyclopedia of, uh, of uh, uh, political science ready uh, because I'm going to have mine ready. And you better be ready to discuss fascism at a deep level, right? Factual analysis and all that sort of thing. Fascist movements and the uh, fundamental flaws of fascism and fascist ideology. Because if you just think you're an authoritarian, like if you're just an authoritarian and not an actual fascist, then I'm going to fucking call you out so hard that you don't even know your own shit, right? That you're going to be like, I'm a fascist, but you're not actually a fascist. This would be hilarious. Um. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, tech support. I'm going to investigate because that's part of the Socratic methodology, tech support. I'm a big fan of, right? I'm going to ask questions. I want to know how you got to fascism. Right? No, I'm gonna know where you're from, how you got there. Like, yeah, oh yeah. Don't worry, tech support. I'll I'll do I'll do what I do, man. I'll do what I do. Yeah. So we got 15 minutes on the card, right? Like, um, what, what was that when I said that? 7:05. Let's be generous. We'll give until 7:20. We'll give until 7:20. <clears throat> oh, Aka, of course. Of course, but I will, you know, just be. Uh, and uh, yeah, Stone. Thanks for that follow, like half an hour ago. Sorry about that. Uh, but thanks for that follow. Uh, yeah, this this should be entertaining. Um, I mean, it might set back. It we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Right? If it actually comes through. Uh, oh, it doesn't work on that controller as much. I should get my old controller and just fo so I can press X. Press X to doubt, y'all. Press X to doubt. But if he actually does come through, it'll be an interesting conversation. It's been a while since I spoke to a like a real self-described fascist. We'll segue into theory. Dude, okay, so I was planning on doing Popo's Bizarre Adventures, but Popo's, Popo's Bizarre Adventures gets long. Um, so if we actually do the fascist conversation, we may not get to Popo's Bizarre Adventures 
Uh, we may actually just do another reading from Rules for Radicals because we are burning through this one. And the next section is tactics. Um, so, you know, yeah. Um, we may just do that instead. We'll see. But like I said, we'll give this guy tw we'll give this guy his his time. We'll give him till seven twenty. I'm being generous. Um, and we'll see whether you know put up or shut up. Uh, I want a popo dough. I mean, whether popo's bizarre adventures gets long, it can take a couple of hours. So. You're desperate for tactics. Uh, I really hope this boy messing uh, messing me about our convo on stream earlier is because he felt awkward, not because female username. Here's hoping I should have higher standards, but I don't. Oh, uh, Karina, what happened? I am desperate for tactics. <laughs> this is tech support, dude. Tactics is a good fucking chapter. Um, it's a good fucking chapter. Oh, uh, do do boo. Everybody got their International Encyclopedia of Political Science up and ready so you can follow along for definitional sets of fascism and understand where he's out he's an outlier and not exi and not a fascist at all. Um, just because you're a racist and you believe in white power and you believe in authoritarianism, authoritarianism doesn't make you a fascist. Um, there's actually a synthesis of far left and far right that has to be included. And the, the truth of the matter is, is that most fascists who, who are even self-described as fascists don't believe in fascism. They believe in ethno-nationalism. They believe in authoritarianism. They believe in, you know, the, uh, these sorts of s uh, structures, right? Um, vanguardism, oligarchism even, but they don't, um, they tend not to actually believe in fascism. Fascism is this sort of merger between the two. Um, it takes elements of like syndicalism and merges it with like far right um, ethno nationalism and hi hyper authoritarianism and that sort of thing. Um, I, Kaiser, I don't think you can. I don't think you can. I, I legitimately don't think you can. Not by a classical definition at all. Um, who's, who's, whose element of that are you pulling from? Are you pulling from Evola? Because that doesn't meet, that doesn't met. Um, any any political science definition uh, you can't you you can't be a non-racist fascist as far as i'm concerned like it's just it, it's it's a core element it always was it was uh, radical nationalism with racist uh with ethno nationalism it's radical ethno nationalism combined with far left ideology such as syndicalism which isn't even far left by today's standards but back in the day syndicalism was most assuredly a far left ideology early early italian fascism I mean, early, early Italian fascism is where that uh, that hybridization occurs. That synthesis of influences actually occurs. Like uh, it was Sorrel that inspired the revolutionary syndicalism. Um, and then like France was probably the first uh, uh, what would be described as like a, an alchemical lab or some shit like that. Right. Um, but that was that was sort of the birthplace of that positional set. Um, and then like, yeah, it it, it, it is. It is an element that is necessary uh, within it. Uh, uh, Deirdre, exclamation sub, exclamation sub, and thank you for being interested even. Um, thank you, Stone. Thank you, Stone. Um, yeah, they're, they're performance artists. They're grifters. Um, dude, okay, so anybody who follows the drama, anybody who follows the drama, because you know I don't follow the drama, is Dylan Burns a fed? Oh, Glazy, there's tons of them. There's tons of them. But not the ones that are, like, online. Fascist! They tend not to be fascists. Fascists are real, but most Americans couldn't identify a fascist if it fucking punched him in the face. Um, so, like, is... I, I saw that. Wait, wait, I saw that. Fucking Heem was doing Dylan Burns revealed as a Fed or some shit. Like, what the fuck was that about? Because, I mean, all I'm saying is called it. 
Um, but like, yeah. Yeah, Beast, I have no context. It fucking, I think it was Cupcake that posted the screenshot from Heem. Saying, like, Dylan Burns a fed or some shit like that. Which, of course he is. Yes. Yes. Nobody trusts Dylan Burns. Dude, that, that motherfucker is a grifter and a half. I'll fucking say it to his face. Fucking, he defended a serial sexual assaulter on his air. Fuck that guy. Ah, some fucking policy wonk wannabe motherfucker who, for some reason, is a big-ass streamer. He runs the hippy-dippy fucking panels, me toad. He's just some grifter punk who is like some... He's basically a lib. He's basically a lib. Uh, Dylan did a long stream today going over all this, disclaiming that it was all lies. Hmm, sounds like something his, his fed lib ass would say. I don't trust that motherfucker. I haven't trusted him for a while. 100% lib. Yeah. He's a fucking lib. He's, you know. <laughs> fucking bananas. Okay. All right, bananas. Um, all right, what we got? What we got? All right. Oh, yeah. I need to read some of this stuff. Thank you, Cupcake. Hold on. Get... Hey. Oh, no. Coffee should pop up. There we go. Thank you. I see you. I see you. Thank you, Deirdre. Um. Thank you kindly, Deirdre. Uh, Crimson, hi, I'm uh, how I'm back. I'm finished making dinner, beef bulgogi, and mushroom hot pot. That's that's solid. That's solid. I dude, I need to get. I have not gotten any food prepared for tonight. I'm fine by the seat of my pants. Um, I've got some leftover, but it's nothing to meet my macros. Enjoy your last seven minutes talking. Here's a stone. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, it's seven thirteen. He's got. He's got seven minutes. Fucking stones on the clock. Fucking stones on the clock. <laughs> stone sitting there with a fucking stopwatch going. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Oh. <laughs> um, like I, said, like I said, Stone, I'll have the conversation with just about anybody, but I'm not going to mince words. I'm not going to fucking pull punches, right? Hey, oh, Jesus. Hey, thank you. Thank you for the most recent dono. I see you. I fucking see you. Um, Thank you. That was, um, that was generous. That was generous. Thank you kindly. Um, so... <laughs> uh. Oh, let's see. <laughs> Donate for Kai's tithing to the two dude Bobby. Um, I need to go back to I'm almost out. I'm almost out. I need to go back to the T Wizard already. Dude, I've been making like full glasses of it for stream and shit like that. I need to go back to the T Wizard already. Yeah. Dude, that shit's gonna be a habit. That shit's gonna be a habit. Bye, Caboose. Bye, Karina. Take care of yourselves. Enjoy your D or D. D or D. D or D. Your D and D. <laughs> it's Dungeons or Dragons. You don't get both. Um. Yeah. Oh. Ah. Fucking move around. Stretch the legs. Um. Uh, 
I take it you are holding bells. Cupcake, if I send you money, could you send me tea, wizard tea? I mean, he can send you tea, wizard tea. Well, he can't. Dude, he won't do online transactions. You know what? You'd probably have to send me money, Cupcake, actually. Yeah, for real. He wouldn't know what to do with it. The fucking dude who walked in off the street during that whole story. Dude, he was like, hey, can I send you cash app? And the wizard's like, yeah, cash. I can work with that. And I'm like, homie. He doesn't understand what the fuck you're talking about. He doesn't know about Cash App. Yeah, he would he would not at all be able to work online or remotely or via credit card or any shit like that. You would have to send me the money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> T-Wizard doesn't work like that. <laughs> he barely knows what money is. <laughs> like he's 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 aware of the concept and that like this stuff costs something and then other person gives something. He barely barely checked into that. The T Wizard is the man, though. Yes, he is the man. Yep, the T Wizard is the man. Um, I love, I love the dude. He's hilarious. You know what, Cupcake? I'm not. Look, Cupcake. Talk to me. Talk to me after the stream. I'm not, I'm not making this a thing. I'm not hooking put fucking people up. But I know how far you are, Cupcake, and shit like that. Money involves shells and shiny rocks, right? I mean. Puka, I'm not, he, he been to Woodstock? Probably, boom, probably. Um, Puka, he takes all of the, like, like when he works with the Navajo Nation, right? He's, like, official with them, by the way. When he works with the Navajo, Navajo Nation, he takes nothing in, like, currency. It's all in trade. Like, they'll show up with, like, literally, like, a legit handmade bow and arrow set and be like, here, will you take this? He's like, yeah, here, whatever. Here's, like, six months worth of product. He has zero like he doesn't give a shit. He doesn't give a shit. The guy's the guy's amazing. Um, yeah. So, of course. All right, we're doing this. <clears throat> this will be fun, dude. That bow and arrow set was awesome. Yes, it was, Bobby. Dude, that shit was for real. Like I pointed that out to Bobby. I'm like, you know, that shit's real, right? <laughs> like that's not a fucking like that's not a stage piece. Like that's some real shit. It's fucking amazing. All right, let's do this. Ah, uh, what's up? I'm going to call you. Ah, you know what? Do you want Holden or Doginator or Dog? Um, you need to stay in on air or else nobody else can hear you. You can call me Holden. Okay. Can you count to five for me, please, Holden, so I can get a voice check so we can get your levels so you're equal to mine? One, two, three, four, five. Cool. That works for me. Uh, what's up, Corey? Um, so there's a, there's I'll a, just, I'll just get this on speaker. Hold on. No worries. No I'm, worries. I, we're, we're good. Okay. So what's up? Ah, not much, dude. Just doing me, right? You know, doing the stream thing. Fucking, it's, you know, kind of kind of a quiet day, but I was having fun demolishing some social conservatism bullshit talking points. That was that was definitely a fun uh, fun time for me. Um, Define social conservatism to me. My- uh, basically, we want things to remain the way it is or roll it back to the way it was. I believe in some kind of concept like that, but... You know, a little bit more extreme. How far back you want to go? Uh, I believe in white power. I mean, I understand that you've you've stated that unequivocally, but it doesn't really answer my question. How far back you want to go? Uh, I don't want to go back. I just want certain things to change. Um. So may may I ask? Hi, my name's Kai. By the way, real name. I live in Las Vegas. I've lived all over this country. I've lived in Tennessee for a time as well. Uh, it's been a- all right. My name is Holden Bells. Okay. I'm from Jackson, Mississippi. All right. There. Now we got ourselves introduced. Cool, cool. All right. Um, so may I ask? Hi. Uh, I'm also, I'm coming up on 40. Makes no difference. I'm basically there. Um, what age, age range are we working with here? You don't have to give your exact age. Uh, I'm 32. I right. sorry. 30s, Mississippi. Go boy, right? Go boy. Ah, oh, I miss it, dude. I'm I, I miss the South. I miss the South. I had a good I had, I had a good run there. It's a little weird, but I had a good, I had a good time there. Um, well, we got tornadoes coming in right now. Oof. Well, if I hear the siren going off in the background and you disappear all of a sudden, I know what's up. Don't worry. Ah, uh, fucking. See, what's gonna happen is my drawl is gonna come out the more I speak to you. 
I'm going to start sounding like a Southerner because that's the shit that happens, right? Because um, I spent a, a bunch of years in Tennessee, and my I do have a drawl sometimes. So if I start sounding Southern, y'all, it's because I'm on the line with a, uh, with a good old boy. All right, so how did you actually arrive at this position? What, what led you to the position of being sort of of a um, specific bent of political stance, so, shall we say? We'll investigate further, but how'd you get there? Well, for one, I used to be a conservative. Hell, I even used to vote Democrat when I was younger, but then I turned conservative. Why? But but why? Yeah, why? Because Obama was doing a poor job. We had lo- our unemployment rate was going high up. It was awful. Obama was the worst president we've ever had. I know. I understand that you can un, you can argue that George W. Bush was ar, was horrible because of recession and the Iraq War, which caused recession. Okay. But at the same time, Obama has caused a lot of problems in our country. Have this would be where I, I am. I am not Democrat or Republican, by the way. Uh, that's that's fair. I, I presume someone is ascribing to literal fascism would probably not be and participating I, and in I party not, politics. And I did not vote in the 2020 election, so don't ask me. Okay, interesting. Um, so <clears throat> would it be fair? It's all rigged. Would it be fair then to state that in fact the problem probably isn't the president themselves, but the system itself? Yeah. Okay. All right, we can we can find some common ground here, right? We can find some common ground. Um, I don't know if you were here, but I am an anarchist, right? I'm essentially the antithesis to you, right? I'm I'm the polar opposite of what you would essentially be. So we understand each other's positions. Um, so so you want to bring the system down? Yes, but for entirely different reasons. <laughs> Let, let's hear them. Uh, because essentially I believe in individual autonomy and I am, uh, ethically, uh, uh, I am ethically opposed to coercive and oppressive frameworks. Functionally speaking, they're also not, uh, efficient mechanisms of operation. So there's a ethical framework that informs my decision-making as well as a, just a sheer pragmatic, uh, system that informs my decision-making as well. Fascism is authoritarianism is uh, not as efficient as distributed, individually driven topologies. All right, I get where you, I get where you're coming from. Okay. Um. So, yeah. so may I ask, what is driving the um the the what is driving the uh, the white power element of your your belief? Because I think this country was built on white people's success, including in Europe too. Let's think about it. We, uh, why people have created all the great inventions in this world? They create structures. They created Rome. They created America. Are you all are building? You, are you aware that the Italians were not considered white for a very long period of time in this country? Well, I well I consider them white. Interesting. How how okay, well, how well, dark you, can you, how look, dark can you, you get look, before you don't, you don't classify Aryan, them as white? Look. I just want to make something clear. You don't have to be completely Aryan to believe in white power. <laughs> Glazy. Um, aren't you Sicilian, Glazy? Um, so you don't have to be completely Aryan to believe in white power. This is, the, this, nope. is, this is one of the fascinating statements because have you ever actually seen somebody f- who, who is an Aryan? Uh, well, that's because it was a – that's because uh, – <clears throat> nope. Can't say I have. Okay, so they're not white. That's 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 the first thing that you need to understand. Um, so let me give yeah, you. Let, I know I know where it comes from. Let, let it comes me give, from. Uh, I'll put it on screen so we can see somebody who would be classified as an Aryan. Right? This, all right. This is what an Aryan looks like. Hold on. Let me see the screen. Let me check your screen. I can't say it. <laughs> so it'll be up on the screen if you uh, you know if you ever get it. Um, it, it this is this is a fascinating uh, misconception uh, <laughs> about the the nature of this region and the people involved and a sort of general co-opting 
of a term that has very little to do with the actual reality of the situation. They're, they're, well, bra- they're brown. Aryans are brown. Think about it like this, okay? Think about it like this, okay? Hitler, he, he was in pure blood, right? Are you aware of the, the, the multitude of genetic filters that humanity has passed through in our, our evolutionary? Wait, hold on. How old do you believe the world to be before I begin that line of query? Well, I'm not, I'm not here to talk about philosophy. I'm not here to talk about how the world was created with you. I want to talk about, you know, political co- con- construct. But if the political construct is informed by a faith-based foundation that has no merit in reality, then that is a part of the conversation. So I need to know if you are a young earth, a young earther or whether you believe the world to be, you know, approximately four, 4.3 billion years of age. Well, I believe I, be, well, I'm a Christian. Okay. Okay. So I believe 6,000. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So young earther. Okay. That I, I, I just need that context before I even begin any line of inquiry down that road. Um, so let's talk about your political framework, right? Like I, I'm not gonna like I'm not even gonna begin to uh, start scratching that surface. But you, you, you ascribe yourself to fascism, correct? Yep. So how do you understand? Fa- what do you understand fascism to be? Uh, it's a government, an authoritarian government ran, ran by higher ups like me. Like, for example, if I'm in America and I want to make America fascist, that means all the minorities need to go okay. because it's a minority based system. You know that, right? Ours. No, fascism. Okay, no, okay. I was like, wait a second. Well, it depends. Fascism is a minority-based system, and we're against the minority. Okay, so fundamentally, you find yourself to be qualified as a superior entity based on elements of sociological and physical construction that you genetically had very little, you didn't have anything to do with it, right? Like you are essentially taking credit for other white people's creations. And and based on history. Yes. Okay. How about the fact that in Africa, they didn't even invent the wheel until the Europeans came in. You know, that's That's a fact. No, no, that's a fact. Uh, no, cite, yeah, cite a your fact. hold they in, they, hold in, they cite your source. The wheel. Cite your source. L- look it up. No, that's what not. That's wheel, not how that works in this in world. Africa. Here, I can. I can get you. I can get you an article and DM it to you. Hold on. Yeah. Hold on. Go for it. I can prove this right now. Can you hear me still? Uh huh. Yeah, I can hear you. Just waiting on, waiting on that evidence. All right. Check that article I just sent you. I just looked it up. It was they didn't know what the wheel was until the nineteenth century. Uh, he sent me a quarrel link, everyone. So so you're aware. He's unaware. Uh, he's unaware that there are depictions on the Saharan North African uh, petroglyphs that have uh, depictions of wheeled, uh, of wheels dating back 10,000 years. But he doesn't believe in a time frame of 10,000 years, so we should take note of that. Um, and the simple answer is because Africans knew how to make and utilize the wheel. Just look at the Ashanti, precursors to modern-day Ghanaians, who constructed wheel lock boxes called Faroa, or the ancient Saharan rock paintings in what would become the Wagadu Empire, pre-colonial kingdoms of West Africa. Did such a ed- do you Source your time periods? Do do you, okay? So pre-colonial kingdom of West Africa. That's before European arrival. That's what those words mean. 
Okay. So let's see. Let's see. Let's see. The Ashanti. Let's see. That should be an interesting search. Um, apparently that's a person too. Okay. Yeah, and all the rich rich parts of Africa, they had wheels, but, you know, all the poor parts, you know. So, all right. So, also, just re- further reading, Af- Africans did know how to make the wheel. It just wasn't as widespread as it was on the Eurasian continent, mostly because of the size, lack of reliable beasts of burden in certain areas, and overall reli- unreliability in areas with the tetse fly or heavy vegetation. So, the link you have just provided me, in fact, states that the Africans did know how to make the wheel. Nah, well, I you, this is your this is did. your evidence. You have places, provided me this I said, evidence. I said certain places. You have I provided me this evidence. Know until, so, it wasn't widespread until the nineteenth century. So anyway, um, I, 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 that's always my favorite thing when people provide me evidence that contradicts their own position. Um, so yeah, cupcake. That's neither here nor there. Um, so no, Puka, they never read it. Um, okay, so you believe you are somehow superior to a group. Um, what, out of curiosity, out of curiosity, you're 32. That's, you know, um, over 32. That's, 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 that's plenty of time. What have you invented in your time? What have I invented in my time? Uh-huh. What, what, well, in, what inventions do you, do you have credited to your name? <laughs> I'm not an inventor, but I can name more white inventors and black inventors. Can you? Yeah. How many How many white inventors can you name? Uh, let's see. Tom Thomas Edison. He created the light bulb. Isn't that true? So you're you've got one. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, and uh, that <laughs> that one guy. What's his not the one that created the atomic bomb, the German guy, Albert Einstein, yeah. Albert Einstein didn't create the atomic bomb. Oppenheimer ran the project. Albert Einstein created some of the underlying physics. Yeah, because he's a Jew. Okay, so that was that was that was fun. Um so let's start. Let's start the ri- list. Dr. Philip Amogwali. He is a uh, golden uh, Golden Bell Prize winner. He is uh, the equivalent of a Nobel Prize for developing the fastest supercomputer software in the world. He is a black man. Dr. Marion Croak. She is a uh, she is a fascinating uh, programmer. She uh, essentially the voice voice over Internet of Protocol technologies that we use to communicate right now. She is the uh, creator and developer of those uh, of those technologies. Uh, James E. West is a Again, another black inventor who developed the uh, electroacoustic transducer electric microphone in the 1960s. Essentially, the microphone that you have in your phone is the microphone that uh, James E. West developed. Dr. Jane Cook Wright, she uh, is a doctor of history of medicine. Her refrigeration techniques and standards basically drive our modern medicine and vaccine industry and today. And you Googled all this up. And what's the point? You, you couldn't name it off the top of your head. You (laughs) you require evidence that black people invent things. So I'm providing it. The fact of the matter is, is that you rely on old, tired dog whistles. You rely upon the history of a people that you have no association with. You rely upon the achievements of others that have achieved greatness and ascribe yourself to that greatness merely because you share a just fluke of birth. You just happen to be white. Therefore, you are somehow equivalent to the likes of Robert Oppenheimer and fucking Einstein. Because you share a lack of melanin in your skin. Genetically, yes. Are you intellectually equivalent to Albert Einstein because you are white? Well, it means I, I'm more intelligent than black people. So you're more intelligent than, say, a dual PhD doctor from Harvard who happens to be black? Maybe. How do you get there? Are you delusional? How do you get how do you get there? 
by passing SATs, passing the board, and then passing two different boards for dissertations, because that's how PhDs work. You don't get you don't get assistance with your PhD uh, dissertation. I, I have to dis. I have to disagree. How many with PhD that? dissertations have you done in your lifetime, son? I I call that affirmative action. How many PhD dissertations have you done in your lifetime, son? Uh, let's see. I did uh. Two years of community college. Okay, and so I have you great, have I have a great career. So you have no understanding of higher academic function, having never and seen it or witnessed it. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, I have a job more than most black people do. Uh huh. What's your job? You you don't need to know my job. Trade work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, I construction am, construction. So I am still querying you. What is this level of greatness that you have achieved that somehow surmounts even just an average black person? Why should you be in charge of anything? Well, let's see. Uh, how? Let's let's name how many uh, king. Let's name how many kingdoms there were in Africa, huh? Compared to kingdoms in Europe. Successful kingdoms, in fact. The richest man in history was a black man from Africa. <laughs> uh, that is not true. No, it's Mansa What's Musa. It? Look it up. The richest man in history was a black man from Africa. That ain't true. Uh, should, I know, we, should we should I we look it up on screen so everybody else can see? I know who the richest man in the world is. In all of history. Yeah. Who is it? John D. Rockefeller. You went for Rockefeller? Yeah, Rockefeller. He's not even richer than living dudes. Uh, in today's economics, he would be worth... Three hundred billion dollars. Uh huh. You want to look up what the likes of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are kicking around these days? Yeah, but three hundred billion dollars. Do you do you know do you know that one is lower than two? Like you know that two is a higher number than one, right? Oh, so you're saying this this darky has more money than Rockefeller? He collapsed the Roman economy just by visiting. Monsa Musa, Monsa Musa traveled and handed probably, out entire bags of gold along his journey to the extent that he collapsed the Roman Empire's economy by devaluing gold so much, by just giving it away as he went along. He traveled with an assortment. He essentially traveled with an entire city's worth of people. This is a level of wealth that you can't even begin to comprehend. All right. If you're saying this is all true, then why are black people in America today are not like him? Huh? Because people like you exist. Good. That's a good thing. So all you've shown me thus far is that you have foundationally no evidence to the claim of your racial superiority. You've shown me that contextually you have no understanding of history. If you look history. at history, that's enough evidence right there. Huh? You do realize, did, you do realize you're <laughs> African, right? Did, did black people write up the Constitution? Did they sign the Declaration of Independence? They were busy making sure that Thomas Jefferson didn't have to work a day in his life so he could write it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, here's the thing. You want to know something funny about the slave trade? It wasn't even caused by the white man. So you know, you know, you know who the first you know who the first uh, slave slave owners were in America, right? Oh, please enlighten me. They were black because they would because other Africans would sell the weakest members of their tribe to white men in exchange for goodies. So the so. Africans 
had tribal arrangements on North America prior to the white man arriving? In our Africa, in Africa, they were selling them to the white man who were going to America. Glazy. Of course and I can by the see way, through his majority bullshit. Of these guys were Jews, by the way. But this is, oh, there's, there's the Jew one. Uh, if anybody's keeping track, check it, check it. Um, so please. Yeah, the Jew, Jews are responsible for the slave trade. Um, most assuredly. So your fascism. Hey, zero. Congratulations yep. on the bingo. Um, yeah, the Jews counter is four to five now. Yeah. Um, so your fascism, right? Functionally, it doesn't work. You know that, right? Yes, it did. Where is it? 92. Okay, when Hitler took power. Hitler wasn't a fascist. Sure. Yes, he was. No, he wasn't. Yes, he was. He was a national socialist. It's it's an all right ideology that is not at all fascism. It has shared characteristics, and by uh, er, uh, like uh, uh, Roberto Eco standards, it would be qualified as er fascism. But by uh, a political scientist definition, it doesn't met multiple requirements because it doesn't have an element of the far left ideology that you have to include, such as syndicalism. Do you understand what syndicalism is, by the way? Okay, then let's look at Italy. Then okay, let's a look real- at Italy. Real True fascism. Fascist. Mussolini, right? Let's do that. All right. Did you know over 90% of of the un- unemployment record, the employment record was in the, over 90% when Mussolini took power? Why is employment a, vi- a viable uh, metric to judge society's success by? Uh, it shows that we're productive. It shows that they actually created something. Okay. How many? How many? Why didn't it survive? Created why didn't it survive? A, a lot. No, no, no. Let's stay on Italy. Why didn't Why didn't Mussolini's fascism survive? Be- because because he was overrun by the Jews in Italy. So the fascists were weaker than the Jews. Let's see. Um, let's be honest here. World War II was a war between Jews and the white man. It's a fact. Uh, okay, uh, feel free to assert that as a fact. You again haven't cited any sources. Well, let's let's take for example the Holocaust, which did not happen, by the way. Of course. And let's and they they like to make up tragedies and try to get America and other countries to join in. Like for example. So, but but, but what you're telling me? Got, hang on. But what you're telling got, me is that your almighty fascism was toppled by just some crafty Jews. Yeah, the Jews did so it. So how is fascism superior to, say, Judaism? Judaism seems like the option here. If I wanted to pick because, a winner in this because, race, because it seems Judaism is kicking the, the shit Jew, out of you. Well, like, for example, you are a the, weak-willed little beta Jews dude fake, compared the to the Jews. Jews. Faked the Holocaust. The Jews faked the Holocaust. Was it a winning strategy? Uh, yeah. Then how come fascism couldn't counter it? Oh, so you, you agree the Holocaust was fake? No, I don't at all. But I, all I'm saying is that you Why seem not? like you're getting Why your not? shit pushed in by these Jewish, like, secret Jewish cabal over and over. And if I'm looking for an organizational structure that seems to be dominant and successful and able to last the test of time, fascism, you're not making a very good argument for. It seems that what I should be doing is going down to my local synagogue and signing up. Because nothing you do matters in the face of this overwhelming Judaism. So well, you're going to go to hell if you do. I don't already believe in the hell does not exist for me. So y- yes, it does. It does. No, God it exists. Prove God it. exists. Prove He'll it. Judge you at the end. Prove it. Read the Bible. The Bible? I have read it. I'm an ordained minister. Wh- which version did you read? I've read several of them. I like the new King James, but the international version's fun. But I've also uh, p- appealed apart the old Germanics and some of the uh, the Greek uh, Orthodox as well. How about the uh, original King James? That's not original by a long shot. The original is in Hebrew. And it's actually in Aramaic. Yeah, I know. I got one translated in English. Yeah, but English is a translation. Therefore, you haven't read the true word of God. 
No, you're I'm reading. reading you're reading. Own, you're reading, reading further deception of men. I'm reading it in my own language. I'm yeah. reading it in my own language. Jesus didn't speak English, my man. Yeah, he didn't. But he was white. No, no, he wasn't. Yes, he, he was. was. He was a Jew from the Middle East, my man. Yeah, and then and then look what they did to him. Uh huh. He was a Jew from the Middle what East. So you're you actually so you are fearful of the Jewish people, yet you ascribe your entire being in life to a Jewish master. Well, you see, he didn't be. Well, you see, he didn't become. He Jewish was a rabbi. After that. He was a rabbi. And, and he was, why, he was no, a rabbi. He wasn't. Yeah, no, no he, he really was. No, he wasn't. Oh, that's that's adorable, homie. You haven't even read your own Bible. Jesus was a rabbi. Hey, he just disconnected. He just disconnected. Ah, oh. oh, that was fun. I know some of you were getting boring, but uh, we're getting bored with that one. But that one, that one, I, I just let me, you know, I know you guys sometimes get impatient. Uh, but, you know. Let me have my fun. I fucking demolished the conservative douchebag from earlier. I, I performed for you, right? Let me have some fun, right? Poking at a fucking white power fascist who thinks that like he, he doesn't understand his religion. He doesn't understand his political ideology. He doesn't understand the people, uh, his country's history, his people's history. He doesn't understand. Dude, of course. Let me have some fun though, right? Yes. No, I know a lot of you think he was trolling. Y'all don't interact with these fuckers. You, you, you fuck the, all of you people who are in chat saying he's a bad troll. He's not a troll. Like that's, that's y'all like y'all fucking dude. I already fucking took the fucking eight year master's degree psychology conservative to fucking task. All right. Let me have some fun with some low hanging fruit douchebag. Right. Sure, 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 sure. Tornado warning, everyone. Tornado warning. That's what it was. <laughs> Glazy, you have no fucking, you have no fucking uh, uh, sensibility about these things. None. I, I don't. You know. Yeah. Yeah. He was genuine, dude. I've met. I've known so many of him. I've known so many of him. Ah. Uh, yeah, Glazy, you just need him to be a troll because your ego is so tied up into the region and some of this shit that you need him to be a troll. You need him to be false. This is about you, not him, Glazy. That's a lot of your shit. We talk about Florida, you immediately start losing your mind, right? We talk about Southerners, you start losing your mind, even though you're an Italian from Jersey, right? This is about you, Glazy, not him. He wasn't a troll. I've known dozen. I've known so many of that dude when I lived in Tennessee and shit like that. That shit's a, a dime a dozen. Um. Yeah, that was um, uh, that was fun. Yeah, Cassidy. I know loads of people like him. Yeah, like dude, he's a dime a dozen. I know you need him to not be real. But truth of the matter, yeah. Uh, what have got in the viewing room? Hey, Cupcake got some African wheel shit. Yep. It's a conservative brain rot. It's obvious to us, invisible to them. Yeah. Because your ideal, uh, your identity and your ego is tied up in this uh, uh, um, false perception that the left is is chasing shadows and that these people don't really exist and that everything is nothing more than a troll or an online scam. And in fact, the left is is just convinced itself that all of these problems exist when in fact they're just phantoms of our imagination. You need that to happen. You need that to be a thing because if we're right, that means you are wrong about a lot of shit, Glazy. And your ego will never let you believe that. You need to do some mushrooms, my man. Um, hey, you should look up the percentage of evangelical Christian population in the U.S. Dude, it's fucking... It, Glazy is a Sven for Florida. I mean, kind of. Yeah. Um, 
Crimson, I've never met a racist to that extreme. I met some bad ones, but geez. Crimson, um, you ever done any time in the Deep South? I mean, we could hear the fucking chew in his mouth when he got on the line, right? We could hear the fucking chew in his goddamn mouth. He's fucking rocking chew and e even. Like, come on. That dude was, he, you know. Yeah. He got pissed when you told him Jesus was a rabbi. I know, right? Jesus was a rabbi. He was a he was a Middle Eastern Jew who was a rabbi. Like that's just that's just Bible. Uh, the more people that are confirmed to believe a high number of those things, especially all at once, really takes a toll on my hope for a future of humanity. Says GL. Yeah, it's it's fucking rough. Um. Oh, no, no, Marcus, he's just, he's still banned on Twitch. He's just not banned on YouTube. Um. Oh, well, you are? Oh, you literally admitted it. Shit. I mean. Um. Um. Okay, and there we go. It's TOS, you fucking dumbass. Like, it's TOS, like I have to protect the channel. Sorry, Wither, I'm just faster about it. Um, Wither, you also have to file a report when you do that. You can't just block him. You know that, right? If somebody literally admits they're ban evading or something like that, you have to file the report in addition to the block. It's it's part of our terms of service as, like, the channel. Like, you have to report them or else we're not doing our due diligence. It's fucking stupid. But, I mean, that's the deal, right? Yeah. When they do uh, threats of violence, right, um, or they admit to ban evasion, yeah, we have to report them. It's just part of our our due diligence and are part of our community guidelines as the channel. Ah, uh, thank you, Wither. Um, so, so you know. So mods know. Duck, so you know. Cassidy, so you know. Yeah, when somebody admits to, like, site-wide ban evasion or does the threats of violence, we have to report them in addition to the ban. That's just part of the deal. Um, so, well, that was, um, that was an experience. That was an experience. The original King James. I know, right? Um, Kaiser, they're supposed to be IP banned out of the gate, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> the original King James. LeBron? <laughs> um, I, you know... It was amusing. It was amusing. Glazy, have you ever known somebody who was a clan member? I have. Right? Like, he's not just a right winger, Glazy. He is a white supremacist. Okay? Like, you know these people exist, right? You, this isn't a figment of the imaginations of a delusional left. You, you know that white supremacists literally exist. There's a fair amount of them, in fact. Like, that, you're convinced that like this dude can't exist, that he has to be a troll. Dude, he's a dip-chewing fucking community college washout from Mississippi who thinks black people have never, in, have never even invented a wheel and are the fucking scum of the earth. He's a piece of shit. He's literally, uh, behold, the master race material. And he got on air to demonstrate this for us. And you're like, he can't be real. Yes, also Jews control everything. Jews control everything. Jews control everything. Including his life, by the way, because he ascribes to the teachings of a... Jewish rabbi. Brilliant when that happens. Um, yeah, like this shit's for real. And your unwillingness to see it when it occurs is the kind of shit that Martin Luther King would talk about when he said white moderates 
And the reason my problem isn't with the Klan member, my problem is with white, with white moderates who allow this to occur. It's that process that he's referencing. Your unwillingness to see literal fucking white supremacists in front of you. That's a problem, man. That's a, that's a problem. You need to look at that shit. Because a lot of us have known these people. A lot of us. Fucking Bobby's in there. Fucking, you know, I mean, fuck, I mean, Cupcake's in there. Bobby's in there. Fucking, I live 45 minutes where he lives. It's an exceptionally disproportionate amount of individuals like there. Right? Fucking so many of us have met people like this. And you're like, no, they can't exist. Dude, they exist by the fucking bucket load. You can back a truck up and just dump them out of the back. It's ridiculous how many of these fuckers exist. Fuzzy. Yeah, tour the South. They're everywhere there. Yeah. Dude. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, man, but you need some fucking reality check. Like, you need a fucking reality check, man. This shit is real. That motherfucker is a fascist white supremacist who wants to, if the black people didn't get out of the country willingly, he'd kill them. You know that, right? You'd, he'd kill them. He doesn't see them as people. He doesn't see them as people. He sees them as subhuman. All right? That's, that's what that dude was trying to tell us. He is trying to show you his true self. And you're just like, nope. That's a problem, man. You need to work on that. All right, let's do some rules for radicals. Glazy, your accent is from New Jersey. And you live in Florida. He had a Mississippian accent. Um, met both clan members and members of the SS who were happy to be uh, nice to me as one of the good ones, says Marcus. Yup. Been there for that conversation. My stepdad has said that shit. He's one of the good ones. Keep in mind that Louisiana once had a gubernatorial runoff between a convicted crook and a former grand wizard of the KKK, says Bobby. Um... Yeah, Cricks, the fact that he's saying that in a live chat room is a real bad part. Right, yeah, he's up front about it. He don't give a shit. Puka, take care of yourself. Sleep well. Right? Uh, GL, uh, I was lucky enough to have lived in a part of Tennessee that was largely transplant, so I don't have to deal with uh, with that as much growing up. Good on you, GL. Um, Crimson, those documentaries where they go to a Klan meeting and spend time with actual white supremacists are real eye-opening for people who live in areas that don't have a ton of them. Yeah, like, dude, just these people are a dime a dozen, man. Yeah, like, I... I, I don't want to tell you, man. Um, all right, so let's kill some shit. Bam. Um, bam. Nope, disable. Disable. There we go. <clears throat> You do realize Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Arkansas, North Carolina, South Carolina. Fuck it. They all have different accents, Glazy. You do realize that there's not one singular Southern accent, right? Oh, wait, you don't because you're, you're a fucking Italian dude from Jersey who thinks he's a fucking Southerner. Dude, get your shit together, man. Fucking, there's different accents from portion to portion. The lowlands of North Carolina have a different accent than if you slide further over. Eastern Tennessee, Central Tennessee, Western Tennessee, different accents. Appalachian Hills versus the lowlands, different accents. Like, homie, you're an Italian dude from Jersey. Clearly, you haven't been paying attention. Like, m get out of fucking Florida, man. Travel around. Go some places. This is terrifying how sheltered you are, man. Anyway, let's get over to Saul Linsky. <clears throat> uh, Deirdre, my family is from Georgia. My husband is North Carolina. They aren't the same accent. No, no, they aren't. If somebody from Texas and somebody from Georgia sounds the same to you, you need help. Hell, Virginia has around 20 different accents I've personally charted, and that's before we talk about ethnic diversities as tech. 
Uh, GL said Northeast Tennessee, where Park Overall was born, and they filmed Deliverance when they moved up in Knoxville area at one point is when the accents got bad for me. <laughs> uh, how far? How long is Tactics? <laughs> Cope, cope harder. Whoever just registered the account proudly cringe, cope harder. I love it. Your your coping feeds me. <laughs> Do you know? Um, I, you know what? Don't tag me. Wither, fucking glazy. Go listen to this shit. Go go listen to this shit. Um. All right. Fuck it, it isn't even clever. Yeah, of course it's not clever, fuzzy. I mean, what do you expect from somebody? These people aren't clever. They're not creative. That's why I was asking that dude, what has he invented, right? Um, fucking, you know, white people have invented all these sorts of things. What have you invented? Nothing, huh? You just try and take credit for a bunch of white people's shit that you had nothing to do with. Yeah, funny how that works. Funny how that works. These people are not creative. They're never creative. They they have they don't have a creative element in their bone in their body, right? Like it's just it is what it is. They they're not humorous. They're not creative. They don't give anything to society. They just try and claim other people's credits. They never actually participate. They never actually organize. They never actually activate anything. They're just fucking hanging on. And claiming other white people's shit. Um, wait, are you suggesting that Elon Musk is a cookie, cu a cookie cutter standard for white people? Says Jill, right? Uh, fucking yeah, hundred percent for sure. Uh, Aka, New York sounds completely different to Philly, and they're down right down the road. Yeah, I, I that's staggering that you don't get that. He needs that glory, and he needs it done for him. Yeah, oh, he can't do it himself, Tech. He doesn't have the, 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 the actual strength of character to do it himself. He has to rely on some other dude's fucking baggage, right? Taking credit with your ancestors built, you step away from those pyramids or I'll have to contribute to society. So help me. Uh, <laughs> uh, meanwhile, other whites call them white trash. Oh, I don't know if I want to do this all tonight. Jesus Christ, this is 40 fucking pages. Oh, man. I've been talking at a clip. My throat, I don't know if this is going to fucking hold, dude. This is 40 fucking pages we have to cover for tactics. Uh, that's going to be... Y'all ready for like some hour and 20 minute shit? Like this is, this is, this is going to be some like, this is going to be a clip. This is going to be like an hour at minimum. So, like, skip one random paragraph every page. It'll be fun. Yeah, I wouldn't do that to, to Alinsky. Um, let me see. Ugh. Um... <clears throat> What day is it? It's Wednesday, Thursday. Oh, all right. All right. <clears throat> all right. Here we go. Oh, I hate breaking segments up, though. Tech support. I'm a. I'm a completionist. I'm a completionist. <laughs> Um, well then I need to go make some tea. Um, all right, bear with me. I'll be back. Chair stream. Take care of yourselves. Fucking, uh, I'll like un, I'll toggle off the fucking Twitch main shit. So you guys can play with some fucking shit. And oh, God, I hate that fucking thing. No, that, that just gets removed. I want that deleted from my fucking sources panel. There we go. We'll turn coffee back on. All right. And then, uh, this, yes, I want, I want the end marked. All right, I'll be back. Oh, Jesus. Oh.
Oh. All right. Tea is being made. I will return to it in a few minutes. Guy is southern by the grace of God, said Trailhead. Uh, anyway. Oh, God. We got a fucking moron. <laughs> uh, fucking brilliant. Do I need do I need to fucking do the comprehensive sexual education all over again? Uh, what do we got? <laughs> Probably cringe is out trying to make me look bad. Ah. What are they doing? What are they doing? Let me scroll up. Did I, did I hurt the capitalist feelings? Is that what happened? Uh. Of course he did. Um, Crix, Crix, go tell like does Mythic know what it's about? Go tell let Mythic know what it's about. If not, yeah, just just to let him know. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Yeah. Um. <laughs> fucking. I mean, he's the idiot who fucking told us that he was ban evading. Dumbass. Um, so what do we got? We got somebody who, oh yeah, shoot weather. I'd love to know what your first memory was. Um, and we've got somebody who thinks we're, we're libs apparently. Nice. Good on you, Kirks. Um, does anyone with that binary shit get that internal dialogue started when you're a child? Um... If you say, let's go, Brandon, it means you want to fuck Joe Biden. You realize that, right? I mean, yeah. Acting like you were asleep to, uh, as you were sleepwalking to get out of chores. How early were your chores? How early did you have chores, G uh, Wither? Pushing a capitalism fetishist over the edge is easy. Just tell them that they're not a capitalist because they actually be, yeah, you're not owning any means of production, right? Anyway, uh, let's see. We're almost there. We'll get the tea. I'm getting the tea brewed. I'll get it filtered. We'll start off. We'll get our reading going. Oh, the sleeping was the chore. Dude, Wither, you've got a weird definition of fucking sleep going on there. Uh, did our, our, our little recent, most recent play toy who came in fucking yelling libtards go away already the capital enthusiasts um <laughs> capital it's capital enthusiasm um that's a shame hey mail rights has been here for a while I just notice that Oh, probably cringe fucked off too. They're not here either. So the genius who called us libtards gone. The white, the white, uh, the, the, the fucking white supremacist is gone. <laughs> Mill Wright's name makes me laugh. I mean, yeah. Drive by conservative outrage. Yeah, I know, right? Fucking yeah. I mean, you know, title, stream title and all. Uh, let's see. Let me close these windows. There we go. Got that closed. Yep. All right. <clears throat> so 
that was interesting. This is an interesting stream. This is shaping up to be a, a content rich stream. Right? I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm gonna have another conversation, dude. We're gonna have two conversations out of this one, right? Conversation two continued from Doctor Professor S C and then Holden Bells. Conversation number three. Um and then we're going to have some Alinsky. So yeah, we're we're fucking pushing content tonight. There's gonna be a bunch of YouTube uploads. <clears throat> Uh, I can make some rice while I uh, do my post show workflow. That's what I'll do. Cricks. Yeah, I mean, you know, it may or may not have been a tornado. Or it might have been the fact that I was pointing out that his Lord and Savior was a Jew. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was the Jew thing. Oh, I just. Um. Arsbreath, thanks for the follow. Um, no, kids should not play football. At least not tackle. Um, you were the tornado, I know. I don't use a rice cooker, Satellite. I, I know how to cook rice. I don't need a rice cooker. I don't need a unitasker. I can just take a pan and make rice. It's no big deal. Um, <laughs> I love that. You were the tornado. Uh, yeah, that, that fucking, he, he was... Um, yeah, thank you. A lot of years of practice. A lot of years of practice. Um, yeah, that was, it was it was funny that the the what the pushback actually that broke him was. I don't, Aka. I don't at all. I cook brown rice and I don't wash it at all. <clears throat> so there you go. Um. Yeah, the Lord and Savior question. <laughs> the Lord and Savior question. Um, yeah, that was that was interesting. That like he actually he you know yeah he hated Jews more than he hated black people. You could say, which is always interesting. They really do have a hard on for the for the Jewish people, don't they? Fascinating. Um. Like, it makes total and complete sense. Exactly, Trailhead. Makes total and complete sense. Logic and rationale out of a white supremacist. Who would have guessed? <clears throat> They're jealous of what they think the Jews are. You have, like, this omniscient, omnipotent fucking, like, power group. Um, Yeah, it is fascinating. I, I personally was a fan of fucking how his fascism was bullshit because the, Jew the Jewish people like toppled it right like if the Jewish cabal beat fascism then isn't the like more dominant powerful ideology Judaism by just like logical conclusion like if you're if you're looking for a power structure right if that's your gig if you're like I'm an authoritarian and jackbooted thuggery and fucking getting things done and authoritarianism is the way then if if all the fascists got their shit pushed in by the by the by the Jews, like aren't the Jews the more dominant group then? Like seems like you should be down at the synagogue signing up. Like that's that's where you should be. It's very weird. It's very weird. Um I mean, Marcus, it is. Whether, whether she wanted to or not, it is. Um, so, all right, I'm going to grab the tea. If he's in the U.S., doesn't even need to worry about the circumcision. I know, right? He's 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 a white boy from the South. Trust me, he snipped. Uh, yeah, because um, Einstein and Oppenheimer, you know, definitely no Jewish heritage going on there. None whatsoever. All right, I'm going to go filter my tea, uh, hit the head, and then I'll be back.
I return with tea. <coughs> Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Oh. All right, let's do this. Rice cookers are fuck functionally pointless, guys. They're just an added expense. Get a fucking pot and learn how to cook. Fight me. <clears throat> All right. Let's do this. Um... All right. Why is this? What the fuck that was about? Oh, there we go. All right. Rules for radicals. Tactics. Uh, tech support, you better still be here, motherfucker. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, oh, you know what? Before I do this, hold on. Hold on. Forgive me. We're on second. Forgive me for one second. Um... What is the bot overlay? Oh, okay, that's that. Uh, that's you guys. All right, well, I don't fucking know. I don't know where it's coming from. Either way. All right. Rules for radicals. Tactics. Here we go. Tactics. We will either find a way... Or make one. Hannibal. Tactics means doing what you can with what you have. Tactics are those con consciously deliberate acts by which human beings live with each other and deal with the world around them. In the world of give and take, tactics is the art of how to take and how to give. Here our concern is with the tactic of taking. How the have-nots can take power from the haves. For an elementary illustration of tactics, take parts of your face as the point of reference. Your eyes, your ears, your nose. First, the eyes. If you have organized a vast, mass-based people's organization, you can parade it visibly before the enemy and openly show your power. Second, the ears. If your organization is small in numbers, then you can do what Gideon did. Conceal the members in the dark, but raise a din and clamor that will make the listener believe that your organization, that your organizational numbers many more than it does. Third, the nose. If your organization is too tiny, even for noise, stink up the place. Always remember... The first rule of power tactics. Power is not only what you have, but what the enemy thinks you have. The second rule, never go outside the experience of your people. When an action or tactic is outside the experience of your people, the result is confusion, fear, and retreat. It means collapse of communication, as we have noted. The third rule is, wherever possible, go outside the experience of the enemy. Here you want to cause confusion, fear, and retreat. General William T. Sherman, whose name still causes a frenzied reaction throughout the South, provided a classic example of going outside the enemy's experience. Until Sherman, military tactics and strategies were based on standard patterns. All armies had fronts, rears, flanks, lines of communication, and lines of supply. 
Military campaigns were aimed at such standard objectives as rolling up the flanks of the enemy army or cutting the lines of supply or lines of communication or moving around to attack from the rear. When Sherman cut loose on his famous march to the sea, he had no front or rear lines of supplies or any other lines. He was on the loose and living on the land. The South, confronted with this new form of military invasion, reacted with confusion, panic, terror, and collapse. Sherman swept on to inevitable victory. It's the same tactic that years later in the early days of World War II, the Nazi panzer tank divisions emulated in their far-flung sweeps into enemy territory, as did our own General Patton with the American 3rd Armored Division. The fourth rule is make the enemy live up to their own book of rules. You can kill them with this. For they can no more, uh, no more obey their own rules than the Christian church can live up to Christianity. The fourth rule carries within it the fifth rule. Ridicule is man's most potent weapon. It is almost impossible to counterattack ri- ridicule. It also infuriates the opposition, who then react to your advantage. The sixth rule, a good tactic is one that your people enjoy. If your people are not having a ball doing it, there's something wrong with the tactic. The seventh rule, a tactic that drags on too long becomes a drag. Man can sustain militant interest in any issue for only a limited time, after which it becomes a ritualistic commitment, like going to church on Sunday mornings. New issues and crises are always developing, and one's reaction becomes, well, my heart bleeds for those people, and I'm all for the boycott, but after all, there are other important things in life. And there it goes. The eighth rule. Keep... The pressure on with different tactics and actions and utilize all events of the period for your purpose. The ninth rule. The threat is usually more terrifying than the thing itself. This works in both directions. The tenth rule. The major premise for tactics is the development of operations that will maintain a constant pressure on the opposition. It is this unceasing pressure that results in the reactions from the opposition that are essential for the success of the campaign. It should be remembered not only that the action is in these reaction, but that action is itself the consequence of reaction and of reaction to the reaction ad infinitum the pressure produces the reaction and constant pressure sustains action the 11th rule if you push a negative hard and deep enough it will break through into its counterside this is based on the principle that every positive has its negative We've already seen the conversion of the negative into the positive in Mahatma Gandhi's development of the tactic of passive resistance. One corporation we organized against responded to the continuous application of pressure by burglarizing my home and then using the keys taken in the burglary to burglarize the offices of the industrial area foundation where I work. The panic in this corporation was clear from the nature of the burglaries. For nothing was taken in either burglary to make it seem that the thieves were interested in ordinary loot. They took only the records that applied to the corporation. Even the most amateurish burglar would have had more sense than to do what the private detective agency hired by that corporation did. The police departments in California and Chicago both agreed that, quote, the corporation might as just as well left its fingerprints all over the place. In a fight, almost anything goes, 
it almost reaches the point where you stop to apologize if a chance blow lands above the belt. When a corporation bungles like the one that burglarized my home and office, my visible public reaction is shock, horror, and moral outrage. In this case, we let it be known that sooner or later it would be confronted with this crime as well as with a whole series of other derelictions before a United States Senate subcommittee investigation. Once sworn in with congressional immunity, we would make these actions public. This threat, plus the fact that an attempt on my life had been made in Southern California, had the corporation on a spot where it would be publicly suspect in the event of an assassination. At one point, I found myself in a 30-room motel in which every other room was occupied by their security men. This became another devil in the closet to haunt this corporation and to keep the pressure on. The twelfth rule, <clears throat> the price of a successful attack is a constructive alternative. You cannot risk being trapped by the enemy in his sudden agreement with your demand and saying, you're right, we don't know what to do about this issue, now you tell us. The thirteenth rule, pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. In conflict tactics, there are certain rules that the organizer should always regard as universalities. One is that the opposition must be singled out as the target and frozen. By this, I mean that in a complex, interrelated urban society, it becomes increasingly difficult to single out who is to blame for any particular evil. There is a constant and somewhat legitimate passing of the buck. In these times of urbanization, complex metropolitan governments, the complexities of major interlocked corporations, and the interlocking of political life between cities and counties and metropolitan authorities, the problem that threatens to loom more and more is that of identifying the enemy. Obviously, there's no point to tactics unless one has a target upon which to center the tactics. One big problem is a constant shifting of responsibility from one jurisdiction to another. Individuals and bureaus, one after another, disclaim responsibility for particular conditions, attributing the authority for any change to some other force. In a corporation, one gets um, the situation where the president of the corporation says that he does not have the responsibility. It's up to the board of directors or of trustees. The board of directors can shift it over to the stockholders, etc., etc. And the same thing goes, for example, the board of education appointments in the city of Chicago, where an extra legal committee is empowered to make selections of nominees for the board, and the mayor then uses his legal powers to select names from that list. When the mayor is attacked for not having any, uh, any black people on the list, he shifts responsibility over to the committee, pointing out that he has to select those names from a list submitted by the committee. And if the list is all white, then, well, he has no responsibility. The committee can shift the responsibility back by pointing out that it's the mayor who has the authority to select the names, and so on and so on. It goes on in comic, if it were not so tragic fashion, and a routine of who's on first or under which shell is the pea hidden. The same evasion of responsibility is to be found in all areas of life and all other areas of city, hall, urban renewal departments who say that the responsibility is over here, and somebody else says the responsibility is over there, and the city says it's the state's responsibility, and the state says that it's the federal responsibility, and the federal government passes it back to the local community ad infinitum. It should be borne in mind that the target is always trying to shift responsibility to get out of being the target. There is a constant squirming and moving and strategy, purposeful and malicious at times, other times just for straight self-survival, on the part of the designated target. The forces for change must keep this in mind and pin that target down securely. If an organization permits responsibility to be diffused and distributed in a number of areas, attack becomes impossible. 
I remember specifically that when the Woodlawn organization started the campaign against public school segregation, both the superintendent of schools and the chairman of the Board of Education vehemently denied any racist segregational practices in the Chicago public school system. They took the position that they did not even have any racial identification data in their files, so they did not know which of their students were black and which of them were white. As for the fact that we had an all-white school and all-black schools, well, that's just the way it was. If we had been confronted with a politely sophisticated school superintendent, he could have very well replied, Look, when I came to Chicago, the city school system was falling, as it is now, a neighborhood school policy. Chicago's neighborhoods are segregated. There were, right, there were white neighborhoods and black neighborhoods, and there were, therefore you have white schools and black schools. Why attack me? Why not attack the segregated neighborhoods and change them? He would have had a valid point of sorts. I still shiver when I think of this possibility, but the segregated neighborhoods would have passed the buck to someone else, and so it would have gone into a dog chasing his tail pattern, and it would have been a 15-year job of trying to break down the segregated residential pattern of Chicago. We did not have the power to start that kind of conflict. One of the criteria in picking your target is the target's vulnerability. Where do you have the power to start? Furthermore, any target can always say, why do you center on me when there are others to blame as well? When you freeze the target, you disregard these arguments and for the moment, all the others who may be to blame. Then, as you zero in and you freeze your target and carry out your attack, all of the others come out of the woodwork very soon. They become visible by their support of the target. The other important point in choosing of a target is that it must be a personification. And something general and abstract such as a community segregated practices or a major corporation or city hall. It's not possible to develop the necessary hostility against City Hall, which after all is a concrete, physical, inanimate structure, or against a corporation, which has no soul or identity, or a public school administration, which again is an inanimate system. John, C uh, John L. Lewis, the leader of the radical CIO labor organization in the 1930s, was fully aware of this. And as a consequence, the CIO never attacked General Motors. They always attacked its president. Alfred Ice Water in his veins Sloan. They never attacked the Republic uh, Steel Corporation, but always its president. Bloodied hands Tom Girdler. And so with us... When we attacked then-superintendent of the Chicago public school system, Benjamin Willis, let nothing get you off your target. When this focus comes, uh, with this focus comes a polarization. As we have indicated before, all issues must be polarized if action is to follow. The classic statement on polarization comes from Christ. Quote, He that is not with me is against me. Luke chapter 11, verse 23. He allowed no middle ground to the money changers in that temple. One acts decisively only in the conviction that all the angels are on one side and all the devils are on the other. A leader may struggle towards a decision and weigh the merits and demerits of a situation, which is 52% positive and 48% negative. But once that decision is reached, they must assume that their cause is 100% positive and the opposition is 100% negative. They can't ever toss it into limbo and avoid that decision. They, they can't weigh arguments or reflect endlessly. They have to decide and act. Otherwise, there are Hamlet's words. And thus, the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er the pale cast of thought. 
and enterprises of great pith and moment, with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Many liberals, during our attack on the then school superintendent, were pointing out that after all, he wasn't 100% a devil. He was a regular churchgoer. He was a good family man, and he was generous in his contributions to charity. Can you imagine in the arena of conflict charging that so-and-so is a racist bastard and then diluting the impact of the attack with qualifying remarks such as, hey, he's a good church-going man, generous to charity, and a good husband? This becomes political idiocy. An excellent illustration of the importance of polarization here was cited by Ruth McKinney in Industrial Valley, her classical study at the beginning of organization of the rubber workers in Akron, Ohio. Lewis, John L. Lewis, Lewis faced the mountaineer workers of Akron calmly. He had taken the trouble to prepare himself with exact information about the rubber industry and the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. He made no vague general speech, the kind the rubber workers were used to hearing from Green, then president of the AFL. Lewis named names and quoted figures. His audience was startled and pleased when he called Cliff Slusser by name, described him, and finally denounced him. The AF of L leaders who, uh, who used to come into Akron in the old days were generally doing well if they remembered who Paul Litchfield was. The Lewis speech was a battle cry, a challenge. He started off by recalling the vast profits of rubber companies had always made, even during the deepest days of the Depression. He mentioned the Goodyear labor policy, quoted Mr. Litchfield's pious opinions about the partnership of labor and capital. What, he said in his deep, passionate voice, what have Goodyear workers gotten out of the growth of the company? His audience squirmed in its seats listening with almost painful fervor. Partnership, he sneered. Well, labor and capital may be partners in theory, but they are enemies in fact. The rubber workers listened to this with surprise and great excitement. William Green used to tell them about the partnership of labor and capital nearly as eloquently as Paul Litchfield. He was a man who put into words what eloquent and educated and even elegant words, facts they knew to be true from their own experience. He was a man who said things that made real sense to a guy who worked on a tire machine at Goodyear. Organize, Lewis shouted, and his voice echoed from the beams of the armory. Organize, he said, pounding the speaking pulpit with, uh, until it jumped. Organize, organize. Go to Goodyear. Tell them you want some of those stock dividends. Say, so we're supposed to be partners, are we? Well, we're not. We're enemies. The real action is in the enemy's reaction. The enemy properly goaded and gui uh, guided in his reaction will be your major strength. Tactics like, organize, uh, like organization, like life, require that you move with the action. The scene is Rochester, New York, the home of Eastman Kodak, or, or rather Eastman, uh, the, yeah, the home of Eastman Kodak, or rather Eastman Kodak, the home of Rochester, New York. Rochester is literally dominated by this industrial giant. For anyone to fight or publicly challenge Kodak in, it is in itself completely outside of Rochester's experience. Even to this day, this company does not have a labor union. Its attitudes toward the general public make paternalistic feudalism look like uh, par um, participatory democracy. <clears throat> Rochester prides itself on being one of America's cultural crown jewels. It has libraries, school systems, university, museums, and a well-known symphony. As previously mentioned, we were coming in on the invitation of the black ghetto to organize them. They literally organized to invite us in. The city was in a state of hysteria and fear at the very mention of my name. Whatever I did was news. 
Even my old friend and tutor, John L. Lewis, called me and affectionately growled, I resent the fact that you're more hated in Rochester than I was. This was the setting. One of the first times I arrived at the airport, I was surrounded by reporters from the media. The first question was what I thought about Rochester as a city. And I replied, it's a huge southern plantation transplanted north. To the question why I was meddling in the black ghetto after everything that Eastman Kodak had done for the blacks, there had been a bloody riot, National Guard, the previous summer. I looked blank and replied, maybe I am innocent and uninformed of what has been happening here, but as far as I know, the only thing Eastman Kodak has done on the race issue in America has been to introduce color film. The reactions, shock, anger, and resentment from Kodak. They were not being attacked or insulted. They were being laughed at, and this was insufferable. It was the first dart tossed at the big bull. Soon, Eastman would become so angry that it would make the kind of charges that finally led to its own downfall. The next question was about my response to a bitter personal denunciation of me from W. Allen Wallace, the president of the University of Rochester and a, pre uh, and a present director of Eastman Kodak. He had been the head of the Department of Business Administration, formerly at the University of Chicago. He was at the university when it was locked in bitter warfare with the black organization in Woodlawn. Wallace, I replied. Which one of you are talking about, Wallace of Alabama or Wallace of Rochester? But I guess there isn't any difference. So what was, there, what was your question? This reply, one, introduced an element of ridicule. And two, it ended any further attacks from the president of the University of Rochester, who began to suspect that he was going to be shafted with razors and that an encounter with me or my associates was not going to be an academic dialogue. It should be remembered that you can threaten the enemy and get away with it. You can insult and annoy him. But the one thing that is unforgivable and that is certain to get him to react is to laugh at them. This causes irrational anger. I hesitate to spell out how specific applications of these tactics. Uh, I hesitate to spell out specific applications of these tactics. I remember an unfortunate in experience with my Reveille for Radicals, in which I collected accounts of particular actions and tactics employed in organizing a number of communities. <clears throat> For some time after the book was published, I got reports that would-be organizers were using this book as a manual. And whenever they were confronted with a puzzling situation, they would retreat into some vestibule or alley and thumb through to find the answer. There can be no prescriptions for particular situations because the same situation rarely occur recurs and any more than history repeats itself. People, pressures, and patterns of power are variables, and a particular combination exists only in a particular time. Even then, the variables are constantly in a state of flux. Tactics must be understood as a specific applications of the rules and principles that I have listed. It's the principles that the organizer must carry with them into battle. To these, they apply their imagination and then relate them tactically to specific situations. For example, I've emphasized and re-emphasized that tactics means you do what you can with what you've got, and that power in the main has always gravitated towards those who have money and, tho uh, and whom people follow. The resources of the have-nots are one, no money, and two, lots of people. All right, let's start from there. People can show their power by voting. What else? Well, they have physical bodies. How can they use them? Well, now a melange of ideas begins to appear. Use the power of the law by making the establishment obey its own rules. Go outside the experience of the enemy. Stay inside the experience of your people. 
emphasize tactics that your people will enjoy. The threat is usually more terrifying than the tactic itself. Once all these rules and principles are festering in your imagination, they grow into a synthesis. I suggest that we might buy 100 seats for one of Rochester's symphony, uh, symphony concerts. We would select a concert in which the music was relatively quiet. The 100 black members would then be given the, ticket, the tickets who would first be treated to a three-hour pre-concert dinner in the community in which they would be fed nothing but baked beans, and lots of them. Then the people would go to the symphony hall with obvious consequences. Imagine the scene when the action began. The concert would be over before the first movement. If this was a Freudian slip, so be it. Let's examine this tactic in terms of concepts mentioned above. First, the, disturb uh, the disturbance would be utterly outside the experience of the establishment, which was expecting the usual stuff of mass meetings, street demonstrations, confrontations, and parades. Not in their wildest fears would they expect an attack on their prized cultural jewel, their famed symphony orchestra. Second, all of the, uh, all of the action would ridicule and make a farce of the law, for there's no law. And there would probably never will be banning natural physical functions. Here, you would have to have a combination not only of noise, but of odor. What you might call natural stink bombs. Regular stink bombs are illegal and cause for immediate arrest. But there would be absolutely nothing here that the police department or the ushers uh, or any other servants of the establishment could do about it. The law, completely paralyzed. People would recount what had happened in the symphony hall and the reaction of the listener would be to crack up in laughter. It would make the Rochester Symphony and the establishment look utterly ridiculous. There'd be no way for the authorities to cope with any future attacks of a similar character. What, what could they do? Demand that people not eat baked beans before going to a concert? Ban anyone from succumbing to natural urges during the concert? Announce to the world that concerts must not be interrupted by farting? Such talk would destroy the future of the symphony season. Imagine the tension at the opening of any concert. Imagine the feeling of the conductor as he raised his baton. With this would come certain fallouts. One of the following mornings, the matrons, to whom the symphony season is one of the major social functions, would confront their husbands, both executives and junior executives, at the breakfast table and say, Honey, we are not going to have our symphony season ruined by those people. I don't know what they want, but whatever it is, something has got to be done, and this kind of thing has to be stopped. Lastly, we have the universal rule that while one goes outside the experience of the enemy in order to induce confusion and fear, one must not do the same with one's own people because you don't want them to be confused and fearful. Now, let us examine this rule with reference to the symphonic tactic. To start with, the tactic is within the experience of the local people. It also satisfies another rule that the people must enjoy the tactic. Here, we have an ambivalent situation. The reaction of the blacks in the ghetto, their laughter when the tactic was proposed, made it clear that the tactic, at least in fantasy, was within their experience. It connected with their hatred of whitey. The one thing that all oppressed people want to do... Right, yeah, the one thing that all oppressed people want to do, their opponents, is shit on them. Here was an approximate way to do this. However, we were also aware that when they found themselves actually in the symphony hall, probably for the first times in their lives, they would find themselves seated amidst a mass of white patrons, many of whom were in formal dress. The situation would be so much out of their experience that they might congeal and revert back to the previous role. The very idea of doing what they had come to do would be so embarrassing, so mortifying, that they would do almost anything to avoid carrying through the plan. But we also knew that the baked beans would compel them physically to go through with the tactic, regardless of how they felt. I must emphasize 
that tactics like this one are not just cute. Any organizer knows as a particular tactic grows out of the rules and principles of revolution that they must always analyze the merits of the tactic and to determine its strengths and weaknesses in terms of those same rules. Imagine the scene in the U.S. courtrooms in Chicago's recent conspiracy trial of the seven uh, defendants if the seven defendants and counsel had anally trumpeted their contempt for Judge Hoffman in their system. What could Judge Hoffman and the bailiffs or anyone else really do? Would the judge have found them in contempt for farting? Here was a tactic for which there was no legal precedent. The press reaction would have stunk up the judge for the rest of the time. Another tactic involving the bodily functions developed in Chicago during the days of the Johnson-Goldwater campaign. Commitments that were made by the authorities to the Go a Woodlawn ghetto organization were not being met by the city. The political threat that had originally compelled these commitments was no longer operative. The community organization had no alternative but to support Johnson, and therefore the Democratic administration felt the political threat had evaporated. It must be remembered here that not only is pressure essential to compel the establishment to make its initial concession, but the pressure must be maintained to make the establishment deliver. The second factor seemed to be lost on the Woodlawn organization. Since the organization was blocked in the political arena, <clears throat> new tactics and a new arena had to be devised. O'Hare Airport became the target. To begin with, O'Hare is the world's busiest airport, or at least it was at the time. Think for a moment of the common experience of jet travelers. Your stewardess brings you your lunch or dinner. After eating, most people want to go to the lavatory. However, this is often inconvenient because your tray and those of your seat partners are loaded down with dishes. So you wait until the stewardess has removed the trays, and but by that time... Those who are seated closest to the lavatory have gotten up and the occupied sign is on. So you wait. And in these days of jet travel, the, tra uh, the seatbelt sign is soon flashed as the, airport, as the airplane starts uh, its landing approach. You decide to wait until after the landing and use the facilities in the terminal. This is obvious to anyone who watches the unloading of passengers at various gates and in any airport. Many of the passengers are making a beeline for the restroom. <clears throat> With this in mind, the tactic becomes obvious. We tie up the lavatories. In the restrooms, you drop a dime, enter, push the lock on the door, and you can stay there all day. Therefore, the occupation of the sit-down toilets presents no problem. It would just take a relatively few people to walk into these cubicles armed with books and newspapers, lock the doors, and tie up all the facilities. What are the police going to do? Break in and demand evidence of legitimate occupancy? Therefore, the ladies' restroom could be occupied completely. The only problem at the men's lavatories would be the stand-up urinals. This, too, could be taken care of by having groups busy themselves around the airport and then move in on the stand-up urinals to line up four or five deep whenever a flight arrived. An intelligence study was uh, launched to learn how many sit-down toilets for both men and women, as well as stand-up urinals, there were in the entirety of the O'Hare Airport complex, and how many men and women would be necessary for the nation's first shit-in. The consequences of this kind of action would be catastrophic in many ways. People would be desperate for a place to relieve themselves. One can see children yelling at their parents, Mommy, I've got to go! And desperate mothers surrendering, all, all right, well, do it, do it right here. O'Hare would soon become a shambles. The whole scene would become unbelievable and the laughter and ridicule would be nationwide. It would be probably, it would probably get a front page story in the London Times even. It would be a source of great mortification and embarrassment to the city administration. It might even create the kind of emergency in which planes would have to be held up while passengers get back aboard to use the planes toilet facilities. The threat of this tactic was leaked. Again, there may have been a Freudian slip here, and so what? Back to the administration, and within 48 hours, the Woodlawn organization found itself in conference with the authorities who said that they were certainly going to live up to their commitments, and they could never understand where anyone got the idea that a promise made by Chicago City Hall would not be observed. 
At no point then or since has there ever been any open mention of the threat of the O'Hare tactic. Very few of the members of the Woodlawn organization knew how close they were to writing history. With the universal principle that the right things are always done for the wrong reasons and the tactical rule that negatives become positives, we can understand the following examples. <clears throat> in its early history, the organized black ghetto in the Woodlawn neighborhood in Chicago engaged in conflict with the slumlords. It never picketed the local slum tenements or the landlord's office. It selected its blackest blacks and bust them out to the lily white suburbs of the slum landlord's residence. Their picket signs, which said, did you know that Jones, your neighbor is a slum landlord? Were completely irrelevant. The point was that the pickets knew Jones would be inundated with phone calls from his neighbor. Jones. Before you say a word, let me tell you, those signs are a bunch of lies. Neighbor. Look, Jones, I don't give a damn what you do for a living. All I know is you got to get these goddamn N-words out of here or you get out. Jones came out and signed our agreement. The pressure that gave us our positive power was the negative of racism in a white society. We exploited it for our own purposes. Let us take one of the negative stereotypes that so many whites have of blacks. The blacks like to sit around eating watermelon. Well, suppose that 3,000 black people suddenly descended into the downtown sections of any city, each armed with and munching a huge piece of watermelon. This spectacle would be so far outside the experience of the whites that they would actually be unnerved and disorganized by it. In alarm over what they were up to, the establishment would probably react to the advantage of the black organizers. Furthermore, the whites would recognize at least the absurdity of their stereotype of black habits. The whites would squirm in embarrassment, knowing that they were being ridiculed. That would be the end of the black watermelon stereotype in that city. I think that this tactic would bring the administration to contact black leadership and ask what their demands were, even if no demands had been made. Here again is a case of doing what you can with what you've got. Another example of doing what you can with what you've got is the following. <clears throat> I was lecturing at a college run by a very conservative, almost fundamentalist Protestant denomination. Afterwards, some of the students came to my motel to talk to me. Their problem was that they couldn't have any fun on campus. They weren't permitted to dance or smoke or have a can of beer even. I'd been talking about the strategy of affecting change in a society, and they wanted to know what tactics they could use to change their situation. I reminded them that a tactic is doing what you can with what you've got. Now, what have you got, I asked. Practically nothing. They said, well, except, you know, we can chew gum. Fine. Gum becomes your weapon. You get two or 300 students to get two packs of gum each, which is quite a wad. Then you have them drop it on the campus sidewalks. This will cause absolute chaos. Why? With 500 wads of gum... I could probably paralyze Chicago, stop all the traffic in the loop. They looked at me as though I was some kind of nut. But about two weeks later, I got an ecstatic letter saying, it worked, it worked. Now we can do just about anything so as long as we don't chew gum. It's quoted Marion K. Sanders, the professional radical, Conversations with Saul Alinsky. As with the Sun Lords, one of the major department stores in the nation was brought to heel by the following threatened tactic. Remember the rule. The threat is more often effective than the tactic itself. But only 
if you are so organized that the establishment knows not only that you have the power to execute the tactic, but that you definitely will. You can't do much bluffing in this game. If you're ever caught bluffing, forget about ever using threats in the future. On that point, you're dead. <clears throat> there is a particular department store that happens to cater to the carriage trade. It attracts many customers on the basis of its labels, as well as the quality of its merchandise. Because of this, economic boycotts had failed to deter even the black middle class from shopping there. At the time, its employment policies were more restrictive than those of other stores. Blacks were hired for only the most menial of jobs. We made up a tactic. A busy Saturday shopping date was selected. Approximately 3,000 black people, all dressed up in their good church-going suits or dresses, would be bussed downtown. When you put 3,000 black people on the main floor of a store, even one that covers a square block, suddenly the entire color of the store changes. Any whites coming through those revolving doors would take one pop-eyed look and assume that somehow they had just stepped into Africa. They would keep right on going out of the store. This would end the white trade for the day. For a low-income group, shopping is a time-consuming experience. For economy means everything. This would mean that every counter would be occupied by potential customers, carefully examining the quality of merchandise and asking, say, at the shirt counter about the material, color, style, cuffs, collars, and price. As the group occupying the clerk's attention around the shirt counters moved to the underwear section, those at the underwear section would replace them at the shirt counter, and the personnel of the store would be constantly occupied. Now pause to examine the tactic. It is legal. There is no sit-in or unlawful occupation of premises. Some thousands of people of, uh, of people are in the store shopping. The police are functionally powerless, and you are operating within the law. This operation would go on until an hour before closing time, when the group would begin purchasing everything in sight to be delivered cash on, de uh, cash on delivery, or COD. This would tie up the truck delivery service for at least two days with obvious further heavy financial costs since all the merchandise will be refused at delivery. The threat was delivered to the authorities through a legitimate and trustworthy channel. Every organization must have two or three stool pigeons who are trusted by the organization. These stool pigeons are invaluable as trustworthy lines of communication to the establishment with all plans ready to go, we began formation of a series of committees. A transportation committee to get the buses, a mobilization committee to work with the uh, ministers to get their people to the buses, and other committees with other specific functions. Two of the key committees deliberately included one of these stoolies each, so that there would be one to back up the other. We knew the plan would be quickly reported back to the department store. The next day, we received a call from the department store for a meeting to discuss new personnel policies and an urgent request that the meeting take place within the next two or three days, certainly before Saturday. The personnel policies of the store were drastically changed overnight. Overnight, 106, 186 new jobs suddenly opened up. For the first time, black people were allowed on the sales floor and in executive training. Hmm, funny how that works. Sure, they just had a change of heart, right? This is the kind of tactic that can be used by the middle class too. Organized shopping, wholesale buying, plus charging and returning everything on delivery 
would add accounting costs to their attack on the retailer with the ominous threat of continued repetition. This is far more effective than canceling a charge account. Let's look at the score. One, sales for one day are completely shot. Two, delivery service is tied up for two days or more. Three, the accounting department is screwed up. The total cost is a nightmare for any retailer, and the sword remains hanging over their head. The middle class, too, must learn the nature of the enemy and be able to practice what I have described is mass jujitsu. Utilizing the power of one part of the power structure against the other. Competition. Once we understand the external reactions of the haves to the challenges of the have-nots, then we go to the next level of examination. The anatomy of power of the haves amongst themselves. But let us go deeper into the psyche of this Goliath. The haves possess and in turn are possessed by power. Obsessed with the fear of losing power, their every move is dictated by the idea of keeping it. The way of life is the haves is to keep what they have and wherever possible shore up their defenses. This opens a new vista. Not only do we have a whole class determined to keep its power and in constant conflict with the have-nots, at the same time, they're in conflict amongst themselves. Power is not static. It cannot be frozen and preserved like food. It must grow or die. Therefore, in order to keep power, the status quo must get more. But from whom? There's just so much more than can be squeezed. Uh, there is just so much more that can be squeezed out of the have-nots. So the haves must take it from each other. They're on a road from which there is no turning back. This power cannibalism of the haves permits only temporary truces and only when equally confronted by a common enemy. Even then, there are regular br breaks in the ranks as individual units attempt to exploit a general threat for their own special benefit. Here is the vulnerable belly of the status quo. I first learned this lesson during the 1930s Depression, when the United States experienced a revolutionary upheaval in the form of a mass labor union organizing drive known as the CIO. This was the radical wing of the labor movement. It espoused industrial unionism, while the conservative and archaic AF of L clung to craft unionism. The position of the AF of L excluded the masses of workers from union organizations. The battle cry of the CIO was, organize the unorganized. Very quickly, the issue was joined with the gargantuan automobile industry, which at that time was an open shop and completely unorganized. The first attack was against the behemoth of this empire, General Motors. A sit-down strike was launched against Chevrolet. John L. Lewis, the then leader of the CIO, told me at the height of the sit-down strike, he had heard a rumor that General Motors had met with both Ford and Chrysler to advance the following proposition. We at General Motors are fighting your battle for, if the CIO beats us, then you're next in line and there will be no stopping them. Now, we are willing to let the CIO sit in at Chevrolet until hell freezes and suffer the losses in our profits if you hold your production of Fords and Plymouths, the price class competitors to the Chevrolet, to your present market. On the other hand, we cannot hold out against the CIO if you boost production in order to sell all potential Chevrolet customers who will buy your products because they cannot get Chevrolets. Lewis, who was an organizational genius with a rare insight into the power mechanisms of the status quo, dismissed it with a perceptive comment. 
It doesn't matter whether this is a false rumor or true, he said, because neither Ford nor Chrysler could ever agree to overlook an opportunity for immediate increase in their profits and power, short-sighted as it may be. The, the internal struggle among the haves for their individual self-interest is as short-sighted as internal struggles amongst the have-nots. I have on occasion remarked that I feel confident that I could persuade a millionaire on a Friday to subsidize a revolution for Saturday, out of which he would make a huge profit on Sunday, even though he was certain to be executed on Monday. <clears throat> Once one understands this internal battle for power within the status quo, one can begin to appraise effective tactics to exploit it. It's sad to see the stupidity of an inexperienced organizer who makes gross errors by failing to even have an elementary appreciation of this pattern. An example is to be found just a couple of years ago when during the height of the rising tide of the struggle for civil rights, certain civil rights leaders in Chicago declared a Christmas boycott on all the department stores downtown. The boycott was a disastrous failure, and any experienced revolutionary could have predicted without any reservations that this would have been the case. Any attack against the status quo must use the strength of the enemy against itself. Let us examine this particular boycott. The error was in trying to boycott all instead of some. Few liberals, black or white, would forgo all Christmas shopping in the most attractive shopping places. Even if it had not been the Christmas season, we know that picket lines are relatively ineffective today in stopping the general population. There's low degree of identification on the part of the general population with the labor movement or with picket lines in general. However, even that low degree can be exploited by placing a picket line in front of only one department store. If the same merchandise can be purchased at the same price at another department store across the street, the slight uneasiness that the picket line creates can affect a significant number of customers. They have an easy enough, visible enough alternative. They will just cross the street. The power squeeze comes when the picketed department store sees a number of customers going across to its competitors. This calculated maneuvering of the power of one part of the haves against the other parts is central to strategy. In a certain sense, it's similar to the have-not nations playing off the USSA, uh, play off the USA against the USSR. Flip of the tongue. <clears throat> Their own petard. The basic tactic in warfare against the haves is a mass political jiu-jitsu. The have-nots do not rigidly oppose the haves, but yield in such planned and skilled ways that the superior strength of the haves becomes their own undoing. For example, since the haves publicly pose as the custodians of responsibility, morality, law, and justice, which are frequently strangers to each other, they can be constantly pushed to live up to their own book of morality and regulations. No organization, including organized religion, can live up to the letter of its own book. You can club them to death with their book of rules and regulations. This is what the great revolutionary Paul of Tarsus when, uh, knew when he wrote to the Corinthians, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth. Let us take, for example, the case of the civil rights demonstrations in 1963 in Birmingham, when thousands of Negro children stayed out of school to participate in the street demonstrations. The Birmingham school, uh, Board of Education dusted off its book of regulations and threatened to expel all children absent for this reason. Here, the civil rights leaders erred as they did on other vital tactics, by backing off instead of rushing in with more demonstrations and pressing the Birmingham Board of Education between the pages of their books of regulation by forcing them to live up to the letter of their regulation and statements. 
The board in the city of Birmingham would have been, uh, been in an impossible situation with every black child expelled and loose on the streets. If they didn't reverse themselves before they acted, they would have reversed themselves one day after they acted. Another dramatic failure to understand tactics came during the second Chicago public school boycott. In 1964, a struggle against a de facto segregated school system. We know that the efficacy of any action is in the reaction it evokes from the haves, so that the cycle escalates in a continuum of conflict. Lacking any reaction from the haves, except public notice of the numbers of children involved, effects of the boycott were significantly over by the next day. This boycott was what I call a terminal tactic, one that crests, breaks, and disappears like a wave. Terminal tactics do not arouse the reaction that is essential for the development of conflict. A terminal tactic is to be exercised only to finish a conflict, for it is ineffective in the development of the rhythm of give and take that one must have while stepping up the war and building the movement. Civil rights leaders could console themselves with the psychological carryovers or the public display of support and similar prayerful hopes, but as far as carrying on the conflict for integration, that was over and done with by the next day. Nice memory. In Chicago, the haves slipped badly when they both, uh, when both a judge and a district attorney muttered that the Book of Regulations banned attempts to induce the absence of public school students and growled ominously about an injunction against all civil rights leaders taking part in the development of the boycott. Here, as always, whenever the haves start living by their book, they present a golden opportunity to the have-nots to, to transform what had been a terminal tactic into a sweeping advance on many fronts. The children wouldn't need to be absent. The leaders would be the only people who needed to act. Now is the time to start an intensive campaign of ridicule, insults, and taunting defiance, daring the district attorney and the judge either to live up to their regulations and issue the injunctions or stand publicly exposed as fearful frauds who are afraid to put the law where their mouths were. Such behavior on the part of the have-nots would probably have resulted in the injunctions. But... By this time, the boycott tactic would have had shaking consequences. Immediately following the boycott, every civil rights leader in the city of Chicago involved in it would have been in violation of the court injunction. But the last thing the establishment wants is to indict and imprison every single civil rights leader, which would have included leaders of every religious organization in the town. Such a step would have shaken the power structure of Chicago and certainly put the entire issue of school segregation policy on the line. Without any question, the district attorney and the judge would have had to depend on postponements in the hope that everybody would just forget about it. At this point now, that the civil rights leaders had the powerful weapon of the book of laws of the haves, they would have had to stand. Uh, they would have had to stand fast publicly, once again taunting, insulting, and demanding that the judge and that district attorney obey the law, charging that the district attorney and the courts had issued an injunction which they had publicly, willfully, and maliciously violated, and that they therefore must be compelled to pay the penalties for this action. If the civil rights leaders insisted that they be arrested and tried, the haves would have been on the run and in complete confusion, caught in the straitjacket of their own book. Enforcement of their injunction would have resulted in a citywide storm of protests and a rapid growth in organization. Non-enforcement would have signaled a breakdown and a retreat of the haves from the have-nots and also resulted in swelling the size and force of the have-not organization. <clears throat> time in jail in 
The reaction of the status quo in jailing revolutionary leaders is in itself a tremendous contribution to the development of the have-not movement, as well as to the personal development of the revolutionary leaders. This point should be carefully remembered as another example of how mass jiu-jitsu tactics can be used to so maneuver the status quo that it turns its power against itself. Jailing revolutionary leaders and their followers performs three vital functions for the cause of the have-nots. One, it is an act on the part of the status quo that in itself points up the conflict between the haves and the have-nots. Two, it strengthens immeasurably the position of the revolutionary leaders with their people by surrounding the jailed leadership with an aura of martyrdom. Three, it, de- it deepens the identification of the leadership with their people since the prevalent reaction among the have-nots is that the leadership cares so much for them and is so sincerely committed to the issue that it is willing to suffer imprisonment for the cause. Repeatedly, in situations where the relationship between the have-nots and their leaders has become strained, the remedy has been the jailing of the leaders by the establishment. Immediately, the ranks close and the leaders regain mass support. At the same time, the revolutionary leaders should make certain that their publicized violations of the regulations are so selected that their jail terms are relatively brief, one day to two months. The trouble with a long jail sentence is that a revolutionary is removed from action for an extended period of time that they lose touch, and if you are gone long enough, everybody forgets about you. Life goes on. New issues arise. New leaders appear. However, a periodic removal from circulation by being jailed is an essential element in the development of the revolutionary. The one problem that the revolutionary cannot cope with by themselves, though, is that they must now and then have an opportunity to reflect and synthesize their thoughts. To gain that privacy in which they can try to make out sense of what they're doing, why they're doing it, and where they're going, what has been wrong with what has been done, and what should have been done, and above all, see the relationship of all the episodes and acts, as they tie into a general pattern, the most convenient and accessible solution to get that time is jail. It's here that they begin to develop a philosophy. It's here that they begin to shape long-term goals, intermediate goals, and self-analysis of tactics as tied to their own personality. It's there that they are emancipated from the slavery of action wherein they were compelled to think from act to act. Now they can look at the totality of their actions and the reactions from the enemy from a fairly detached position. Every revolutionary leader of consequence has had to undergo this withdrawals from the arena of action. Without such opportunities, they go from one tactic and one action to another. But most of them are almost terminal tactics in and of themselves. They never have a chance to think about and uh, think through an overall synthesis, and they burn themselves out. They become, in fact, nothing more than a temporary irritant. The prophets of Old Testament and New found their opportunity for synthesis when voluntarily removing themselves to the wilderness. It was after they emerged that they began propagandizing their philosophies. Often a revolutionary finds that they cannot voluntarily detach themselves since the pressure of events and action don't permit them that luxury. Furthermore, a revolutionary or a person of action does not have the sedentary frame of mind that is the, par- uh, that is the personality of a research scholar. <clears throat> they find it very difficult to sit quietly and think and write. Even when provided with a voluntary situation of that kind, they will tend to react by trying to escape the job of thinking and writing. They'll do anything to avoid it. I remember that once I accepted an invitation to participate in a one-week discussion at the Aspen Institute. The argument was made that this would be a good opportunity to get away from it all and write. The Institute sessions would last only from 10 in the morning to noon, and I would be free for the rest of the afternoon and evening. The morning began with the Institute sessions. The subjects were very interesting, carried over through a luncheon discussion, which lasted until 2.30 to 3. Now, 
I could sit and write from three to dinner, but then one of the members of the discussion group, a most interesting astronomer, stopped in for a chat. By the time he left, it was 5 p.m., and there wasn't much point in starting to write then. For There would be cocktails at 5.30, and after cocktails, there wasn't much point in sitting down to start writing because dinner would be served soon. And after dinner, there wasn't much point in starting to uh, start writing because it was late and I was tired. Now, it's true that I could have gotten up immediately after lunch and told everyone that I was not to be disturbed and gone to spend the afternoon writing. I could have gone back to my quarters, locked the door, and hopefully started writing, but the fact is that I did not want to come to grips with thinking and writing any more than anyone else in revolutionary movements does. I welcomed the interruptions and used them as rationalizing excuses to escape the ordeal of thinking and writing. Jail provides the opposite circumstances. You have no phones, and except for an hour a day or so, no visitors. Your jailers are rough, unsociable, and generally so dull that you wouldn't want to talk to them anyway. You find yourself in a physical drabness and confinement, which you desperately try to escape. Since there is no physical escape, you're driven to erase your surroundings imaginatively. You escape into thinking and writing. It was through periodic imprisonment that the basis for my first publication and the first orderly philosophical arrangement of my ideas and goals occurred. Time and tactics. Enough of philosophical cells. <clears throat> Let's get back to the business of the active essentials of organizing. Among the essentials is timing. Timing is to tactics what it is to everything in life. In life, the difference between success and failure. I don't mean the timing of the start of a tactic. That's important, certainly. But as has been stated repeatedly, life does not usually afford the tactician the luxury of time or place when the conflict is engaged. Life does permit, however, that the skilled tactician be conscious of the utilization of time in the use of tactics. Once the battle is joined and a tactic is employed, it's important that the conflict not be carried on over too long a time. If you will recall, this was the seventh rule noted at the beginning of this chapter. There are many reasons of human experience arguing for this point. I cannot repeat too often that a conflict that drags on too long becomes a drag. The same universality applies for a tactic or any other specific action. Among the reasons is the simple fact that human beings can sustain an interest in a particular subject only over a limited period of time. The concentration, the emotional fervor, even the physical energy, a particular experience that is exciting, engaging, and inviting can last just so long. This is true of the gamut of human behavior, from sex to conflict. After a period of time, it becomes monotonous, repetitive, an emotional treadmill, and worse than anything else, a bore. From the moment the tactician engages in conflict, his enemy is time. This should be kept in mind when one is considering boycotts. First, any consideration of a boycott should carefully avoid essentials, such as meat, milk, bread, or basic vegetables, since even selective buying weakens after a period of time as the opponent cuts their prices below their competitors. With non-essentials, grapes, bananas, pistachio nuts, maraschino cherries, and the like, many liberals can make the sacrifice and feel noble about it. <clears throat> even so, any skilled organizer knows that they can push this negative over into a positive. They can compel or maneuver the opposition to make the mistake themselves. The drama of continuous involvement builds up an immunity to any further excitement. The consequence is that the opposition will finally, out of their own tedium, give in. The pressure of time should be ever-present in the mind of the tactician as they begin to engage in action. This applies to the physical action, such as mass demonstrations, as well as to its emotional counterpart. When the Woodlawn organization in Chicago decided to have a massive move-in on City Hall with reference to an issue on education, 5,000 to 8,000 individuals were to fill the lobby of City Hall in Chicago at 10 a.m. for a confrontation with the mayor. 
At the same time, the strategy was being developed. The function of time in the use of tactic was examined and understood. And therefore, the tactic was utilized to its fullest potential rather than turning into a debacle, as was the case with the recent Poor People's March, Resurrection City, etc. There was a clear understanding on the part of the leadership that when some thousands of people are assembled downtown, the physical tedium of standing, of being in one place for a period of time, begins to dampen and or rather soon. That small groups will begin to disappear to go shopping, to go sightseeing, get refreshments. In short, the life of the immediate metropolitan area becomes much more attractive and inviting than simply being in City Hall in an action that has already spent the excitement of witnessing the op opposition shock. After a while, and by a while, meaning two to three hours, the 8,000 would have dwindled to 800, or less, and the impact of the mass numbers would have been seriously diluted and weakened. Furthermore, the effect on the opposition would have been that the mayor, seeing a mass action of 8,000 shrink to 800, would assume that if he only sit it out for another two or three hours, the 800 probably shrink to 80. And if he sits it out for a day, there'd be nothing left. That would have gained us nothing. With this in mind, the leadership of the Woodlawn organization made its confrontation with the mayor, told the mayor that they wanted action and quickly on their particular demands and that they were going to give him just so much time to meet their demands. Having given their message, they said they were now calling off their demonstration. But they would be back in the same numbers or more. And with that, they turned around and led their still enthusiastic army in an organized, fully armed, powerful withdrawal and left this mass impression upon the city hall authorities. There's a way to keep the action going and to prevent it from being a drag, but this means constantly cutting new issues as the action continues so that by the time the enthusiasm and the emotions for one issue have started to de-escalate, a new issue has come into the scene with a consequent revival. With a constant introduction of new issues, it will go on and on. This is the case with many prolonged fights in the end. The negotiations don't even involve the issues around which the conflict originally began. It brings to mind the old anecdote of the Hundred Years' War in Europe. When the parties finally got together for peace negotiations, nobody could remember what the war was all about or how it had begun. And furthermore, whatever the original issues, they were now irrelevant, irrelevant to the peace negotiations. New tactics and old. <clears throat> Speaking of issues, let's look at the issue of pollution. Here, again, we can use the haves against the haves to get what we want. When utilities or heavy industries talk about the people, they mean the banks and other power sectors of their own world. If their bank says, uh, if their bank say starts pressing them, then they listen and they hurt. The target, therefore, should be the banks that serve the steel, auto, and other industries, and the goal significantly lessening pollution. Let us begin by making the banks live up to their own public statements. All banks want money and advertise for new savings and checking account. And checking accounts. They even offer premium prizes to those who will open accounts. Used to. Opening a savings account in a bank is more than a routine matter. First, you sit down with one of multiple, uh, uh, multiple representatives and employees and begin to fill out forms and respond to questions for at least 30 minutes. If a thousand or more people all moved in, each with five or ten dollars to open up a savings account, the bank's floor functions would be paralyzed. Again, as in the case of the shop in, the police would be immobilized. There is, uh, there is no illegal occupation. The bank is in a difficult position, yes. It knows what is happening, but it doesn't want to antagonize would-be depositors. The bank's public image would be destroyed if some thousand would-be depositors were arrested or forcibly ejected from their premises for trying to open accounts. The element of ridicule is here again. A continuous chain of action and reaction is formed. Following this, the people can return in a few days 
and close their accounts. And then return again later to open new attacks, uh, new accounts. This is what I would call a middle class guerrilla attack. It could well cause an irrational reaction on the part of the banks, which could then be directed against their larger customers. For example, the polluting utilities or whatever the obvious stated targets of the middle class organization. The target of a secondary attack such as this is always outraged. The bank thus is likely to react more emotionally since it, fee it as a body feels that it is innocent being punished for another's, uh, another's sins. At the same time, this kind of action can also be combined with social refreshments and gathering together with friends downstairs, as well as the general enjoyment of seeing the discomfiture and confusion on the part of the establishment. The middle class guerrillas would then themselves enjoy as they increase the pressure on their enemies. Once a specific tactic is used, it ceases to be outside the experience of the enemy. Before long, they devise countermeasures and that, vo and that void the previous effective tactic. Recently, the head of a corporation showed me the blueprint of a new plant and pointed to a large ground floor area. Boy, have we got an architect who is with it, he, ch he chuckled. See that big hall? That's our sit-in room. When the sit-inners come, they'll be shown in and they can, uh, they'll sit there with coffee, TV, and good toilet facilities. They can sit there until hell freezes over. Now, you can relegate sit-ins to the Smith, uh, uh, Smithsonian Museum. Once, though, and in rare circumstances, even now, sit-downs were really revolutionary. A vivid illustration was the almost spontaneous sit-down strikes of the United Automobile Workers Union in their 1937 organizing drive at General Motors. The seizure of private property caused an uproar in the nation. With rare exception, every labor leader ran for cover. This was too revolutionary for them. The sit-down strikers began to worry about the illegality of their actions and why and wherefore, and it was then the chief of all CIO organizers, Lewis, gave them their rationale. He thundered, the right to a man's job transcends the right of private property. The CIO stands squarely behind these sit-downs. The sit-down strikers at GM cheered. Now they knew why they had done what they did and why they would stay until the end. The lesson here is that a major job of the organizer is to instantly develop the rationale for actions which has taken place by accident or impulsive anger. Lacking the rationale, the action becomes inexplicable to its participants and rapidly disintegrates into defeat. Possessing a rationale gives action, meaning, and purpose. <sighs> Tactics. We are... In the home stretch. We are in the home stretch. Let me re enable everything. Frackle, thank you for that resub if you're still here. Uh, ooh, I have an update here. Hang on. Uh, cool. Oh, Jesus Christ. So, thus ends the podcast portion of the stream. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going to have some DJ and story time for you on Monday, hopefully. Do I got a bunch of dudes lined up? Yeah, Beast. Beast, yeah, we could have. We fucking dropped the ball. Trust me, I as a, I admit, I as an organizer dropped the ball during Occupy. Like, we all dropped the ball during Occupy. BLM dropped the ball. Occupy dropped the ball. The hippies dropped the ball. Um, ah, good on you, public. Caught a decent chunk while chorins. It'll be up on YouTube by tomorrow at the very latest. 
Um, car accident. That was a very funny read. I like the beans part. Dude, Alinsky was a master of... He was a master tactician. I mean, he got shit done. He got shit done. Like... Oh, it was a it was an absolute mess. Public, it was an absolute mess. If I knew what I knew now during Occupy, shit would have. I'm not saying I would have changed the course of history. I'm just saying that like my local Occupy, it would have been different. It would have been different for sure. Uh yeah. So there you go. That's fucking, and we are in the home stretch at this point um we are into the genesis of tactic proxy and then after that is the way ahead um so here is this is the genesis of tactic proxy and then this is the way ahead so next chapter we cover and then the end um yeah yeah nine thousand new stockbrokers astral yeah 100 percent I would have been all over it. Um, speeding. It's taken us how many months? Resolution. I'm just, I'm just dedicated to it now. We're just getting it done. I want that fucking playlist done. I want at least one on the channel that I can say we finished, right? But like, here is the entirety of that book. <laughs> done. Um. Yeah. So. And then one day we will, how far are we? We're, I think we're here. Yes, we're here. So we've covered this much Bob. So, you know, one day I'd like to finish Bob Black. Although not every in, everything in here is worth reading, actually, to be perfectly honest. Um, but you know, I, wanna, I wanna get Bob Black in the fucking can. Um, no, no, I like the end cap fucking one. Uh, I really do. Um, but yeah, that is, that is how that goes at this point. I, um, wrong window, wrong window. Oh, let's see how many fucking times I can click the wrong browser window, guys. Let's see if we're fucking two, two times wrong, third time's the, tr uh, the charm. Fucking third try is the charm. Okay, got it. Good, 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 good. Fucking A. Um, public. Do you have anybody that you like that's live right now? Small numbers. Small numbers. You know my deal. You know my deal. Beast said, yeah, I remember when Monterey agreed to move camp a few miles up the road to a campground and just have protesters uh, at City Hall. Couldn't even get people to keep camping in the hall, let alone get real action. Yeah, dude, we fucked up. Thanks, Bubble. Um, Non-binary, man. What a night I'm having. Students in second year being so disrespectful. They get paid to clean it up. Oh, God, I hate that attitude. Not to be funny, but they get paid to work at a hostel. Mm. Um... done because I need to shut the fuck up I need to make food I need to shut the fuck up and I need to do some video editing now <laughs> um how many clips are coming out of that two conversations plus a reading I've got three clips plus this full stream I got four videos going up to YouTube here shortly um everyone thanks for hanging out Take care of yourselves. I'll uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow's another after dark show. Um, so we will have some fun. We will we will get loose. We will uh, get a little intoxicated, and we'll see what we can't do to decompress. Um, and then Friday is going to be we will do Popo's Bizarre Adventures on Friday since we didn't do it today. Because if we did Popo's Bizarre Adventures on top of this, we'd be here till fucking one a.m. Some shit like that. Um, so yeah, we will, we will save Popo's for Friday. 
Um, and then we will immediately dump into Bad Movie Night and forget about all of the horror that we will be covering in Popo's Bizarre Adventures. Um, <laughs> so thick. Go ahead. Yeah, everyone have a good rest of your night. Um, I'll, I'll wave hi, but, you know, everybody say hi to Bizarre for me. Um, and, yeah, I got to go make some fucking rice and shit. So, peace. Catch you guys later.